तो दिस मीटिंग इज बीइंग रिकॉर्डेड भूषण इज गोइंग टू बी आवर मॉडरेटर टुडे भूषण इज very a wonderful surgeon from india he is actually one of our team members in the academics team uh, tugs match academics and i'll let him introduce our uh, tugs academics tugs match academics program uh, but as of now i just want to introduce bhushan first bhushan is uh, has been working with you know in our team for past uh, i guess 5 months now he has been very very active and very sincere with with our with the work he is a mch he is a super specialty uh, uh, resident and doing his super super specialty training in surgical oncology and currently in the final year of his training and is about to become a consultant very soon bushan please take take over dr saurabh i welcome all attendees to the fourth tux match academics program on sleeve gastrectomy how i do it session i'm your host dr bushan i'm a surgical oncology specialty resident in sms medical college at jaipur as now most of us already know and are aware of the tugs organization it's an organization of upper gi surgeons across the world aiming to develop and nurture scientific and academic collaboration in the surgeon community tugs math academics program is a subset of tugs fellowship match program focusing primarily on how i do it sessions our team includes the fellowship coordinator dr saurabh singhal and the other two co coordinators dr asim jindal and dr tania trinfola from greece Today we have with us esteemed speakers and chairpersons who will speak upon and discuss various tips and tricks on sleeve gastrectomy through their videos. So let me first introduce you to the chairpersons. The first chairperson is Dr. Pierre Blanc. He is a bariatric surgeon at Mutualistic Clinic, Saint Etienne, France. There are multiple peer-reviewed articles on sleeve gastrectomy in national and international journals in his name. The second chairperson is Dr. Nidhi Khandelwal. She is a minimal access GI surgeon at Jaslo. Lilavati and Bhatia Hospital in Mumbai, India. She also holds the post for convener of Young OSI, that is Obesity and Metabolic Surgery Society of India. She has a keen interest in performing almost all types of bariatric surgeries and also deals with complex and previously failed or complicated bariatric procedures. The third chairperson is Dr. Pradeep Palati. He is a bariatric and advanced laparoscopic surgeon at Glen Eagles Hospitals, Hyderabad. He is an excellent surgeon and has been a mentor to few of my colleagues, including Dr. Saurabh. He was previously associated with Our Lady of Lords Memorial Hospital, Bringhamton, New York. Now, coming to the speakers, let me introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Rodolfo Ovido. He is a robotic general surgeon at Houston Method Methodist Hospital, Texas, in USA. Also, he is an adjunct associate professor at Texas A&M University College of Medicine. he has multiple papers published in his name including the recent ones on bariatric procedures in rural and urban settings dr rodolfo ovido the screen is yours sir thank you very much dr balgat it's a pleasure to be here uh please i'm going to start uh, sharing my screen uh and if somebody could please confirm that you can see my screen and yes, hear me well rodolfo Yes, sir. Thank you very much. See that. See that. Wonderful, wonderful. So I'm going to start. So it is my pleasure to be here. Um, I cannot tell you how happy I am to to be here with you. It, it, it I honestly, Tux is an impressive society. It's uh, most likely the largest surgical society in the world um, over the last few years with the largest membership, and uh, we are very proud to be part of it. So today I'm going to be talking about robotic sleeve gastrectomy, how I do it. Of course, this these concepts apply to laparoscopy. I want to make sure it, it, while the videos I'm going to show reflect robotic surgery, which is something I'm very passionate about, at the same time these same same principles apply to laparoscopy. Um as the director of robotic general surgery for our hospital system, it's important to me to to teach about robotic surgery, but please remember uh one take home message is that we cannot rely on only one type of modality and we should not rely on only one company so we have to make sure that we know how to do this in all with all possible angles um a few of my disclosures today i will not be endorsing any company at all this is about the technique not about any technology it's uh, specifically So we're going to be talking about sleeve gastrectomy only and I think uh, this is a nice type of 3D representation of what the sleeve should look like. If you pay attention to this, we tend to say it's a vertical sleeve gastrectomy for a reason. 
Although this picture shows the staple line getting very close to the pylorus, it's important to stay away from getting too close to the pylorus because of some issues that we're going to be discussing about later. Uh, it's important to stay at a certain distance that we'll discuss from the pylorus. And then to start the vertical staple line. And in reality, it shouldn't necessarily look like this curve. It should be looking more like a vertical sleeve. Hence the name, vertical sleeve gastrectomy. Pay attention to this little area right here. Please remember, the stapler should not go just next to the esophagus. By doing that, we're putting the patient at risk for a leak. We'll be discussing that technical aspect as well. Um, and then uh, we usually say that 80% of the stomach comes out. It doesn't look like a lot, but truly it's 70 to 80%. And it really, when it's inflated with air and full of food, it is truly that. Um, and so today we won't be discussing gastric bypass, of course, but it's just to compare one to the other. And this is less complex, but one caveat, I want to make sure everybody understands. Let's not regard the sleeve as a, as a very easy operation. That's the danger. A lot of surgeons out there, they think, oh, I can just do six sleeps in a day and call it a day and I'm fine. I'm not going to have complications. That is extremely, extremely dangerous because in reality, when we teach our residents and fellows, there are more than 20 ways to make mistakes on a sleeve and make the patient's life miserable. And that includes stricture formation, stenosis, denervation of the stomach, ischemia, twisting, volvulus, leak, and, and so on and so forth, bioreflux. And so there are many ways that we can actually make mistakes, splenic bleeding or mental bleeding and so on, staple line bleeding. We'll be discussing that later. Just, uh, I know that this is not a theoretical talk. It's, it's really a practical talk, but just one slide. You are, you're, you're, you are familiar with this. Typically the excess weight loss is known to be a 60%, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily 60%. It could be more depending on the patient's diet, exercise routine and motivation and counseling. And um, this is very important. It's ideal for patients with BMI less than 50, but it's not contraindicated if the patient's BMI is greater than that. Also, it's, now, uh, it's ideal for patients with no significant severe diabetes, but it can be used for diabetes, as you know, uh, or any patients with GERD. I'd be very careful with doing a sleeve on somebody with severe GERD, as you all know, because of the incidence of reflux. Um, it's known to be uh, the lowest risk complication in bariatric surgery nowadays, but be careful. Don't think that it's free of complications. Uh, as, I'm, as I mentioned, there could be a lot of ways that a sleeve could be done inappropriately. And so we'll be discussing that. My preferred approach, and by the way, this applies to laparoscopy. Uh, so this is not only for robotics. Uh, nowadays, I do it with the three-port technique. But in laparoscopy or in basic robotics, when you're learning your way in robotic surgery, but try, try to do a sleeve, you do it with four ports, four trocars. One of them is the stapler port. That's a 12-millimeter port either for the robotic stapler or for the laparoscopic stapler. If you're not comfortable using the robotic stapler, you can still do it as a hybrid approach. When you use a robot, but then you don't use its stapler, you use the laparoscopic stapler of your choice. Um, and then the other ones are eight millimeter trocars. Keep in mind, if you're doing laparoscopy, these are fives, fives, five, and this is the 12. Ideally, this is the angle you wanna use to be able to staple and believe it or not, this angle is, is ideal because the stapler flexes 45 degrees and you can staple all the way up to the cardia of the stomach and the GE junction. Now, this is for the liver retractor. Keep in mind that there are, this is for an external liver retractor that is a metallic liver retractor like the Nathanson, for instance, but there are other types of liver retractors that you can use and you can actually put them in different locations. For example, here, there's a paddle retractor or you could use an internal retractor, and then you're saving yourself from this incision. And so your incisions look like this, no more epigastric incision. You only have the laparoscopic incisions you're gonna place and because you have an internal retractor made of hooks and pulleys, and there are different products out there, or you can do it like I do with suturing, just a stay suture from the, from the uh, abdominal wall to the diaphragm to the abdominal wall, and that takes care of the liver usually, in most cases. Very rarely do I have to use an external one. So my preferred technique nowadays, unless there is a problem with too much visceral fat or in a male with BMI greater than 50, or I know that it's gonna be a really tough case and I go back to four ports, but usually if it's a relatively uh, simpler sleeve, then I do it with three ports, this is it. 
one, two, one, eight, one, eight, and then I use the 12. This, this has to be done. And then the one that I usually don't, don't end up uh, utilizing is this one. But remember, never, I tell my residents and fellows, never ever compromise safety for the sake of cosmesis or pain. I mean, safety is the number one uh, aim that we have for our patients for quality. Uh, pain control, cosmesis, return to work, that's secondary to safety. And, and so we always have to strive for safety. So, but if you can, it's really nice to do it with three incisions in my experience. Um, robotic instruments, and then I'll, I'll have a slide that discusses the laparoscopic ones in case you're doing it laparoscopic, but robotics, just a basic set of instruments, honestly, the bipolar forceps to me are essential because you can grasp things, you can uh, retract with them, and they, you already have bipolar, bipolar uh, modality of energy anyway, and I typically use it on my left hand. That way my brain, my brain already knows it's trained to use bipolar energy on the left, but you could use it anywhere. Um, at the same time, the vessel sealer to me is a really versatile instrument. Um, it, keep in mind, you can use something else. I mean, you can use uh, other types of energy advanced devices, the synchro seal, for example, some of my colleagues use it. I, I don't personally use it. I prefer the vessel sealer because it's an instrument that can you be used uh, to suture if you have to suture. It can be used to retract, even though it's not, but it's not the best in the world for that role. Uh, but definitely is very hemostatic. And so you can use it very nicely to dissect. Um, and then the a liver retractor, as I mentioned, it could be an external metallic one, or it could be an internal one, commercial. Or you can just put stay sutures with, with stitches that you can place yourself, and that's the cheapest way. And I'm going to show you a video of that. The stapler, that's a controversial issue. I use it all the time. I use the stapler from the robot, but I have no problem whatsoever. And I use it with reinforcement, with polymer reinforcement. However, some people are not comfortable with that, and they believe more in the laparoscopic one. That's okay. You can definitely use the laparoscopic one. You just need a skilled assistant or resident, somebody skilled at the bedside to be able to fire for you, but it's totally doable. And it's a good thing to teach anyway. Um, and then, you know, plus or minus career, um, I, I tend not to use them unless I'm using the four port technique. If I'm using only three ports, I don't typically use it. And then the staple line reinforcement is controversial. I believe in it. I, I honestly, since I started using staple line reinforcement uh, years ago, I haven't had a a single episode of staple line bleeding, believe it or not. It's really, really, it's made a difference in my, in my practice. And I know I'm not the only one. Um, it's more controversial for leaks, by the way. I think leaks are more of a technical issue, ischemia, tension, technical issue on behalf of the surgeon. So almost done, and then I'm gonna get to the technical part, which is the videos. Laparoscopic instruments, in case you're doing it laparoscopic, absolutely fine, totally, totally fine. I love laparoscopy. You know, I don't endorse only robotics and you can use a bipolar uh, instrument or an ultrasonic energy device. I mean, you could use, I don't know, Legasure, you can use N and Seal, whatever products you have, or you can use the harmonic scalpel, for instance, but again, we're not endorsing any commercial products. Graspers, must, must use graspers that are atraumatic. Liver retractor, same issue. Laparoscopic stapler, yes, whatever you choose to use, um, ideally something with uh, technology that is uh, adaptable to measuring uh, levels of ed ed edema and thickness of the tissues and ideally tri-stapler technology is wonderful. And then remember a laparoscopic needle driver, you may want to fix a hiatal hernia in there, or I myself do an omentopexy or gastropexy uh, to be able to fixate the staple, the, the sleeve in, in place, and that way it doesn't twist in the future. And I'm sure my colleague, Dr. Uh, Alexander Isengar is going to discuss that as a, as a take home message and tips and tricks and what, what mistakes to try to avoid. I certainly have made that mistake and, and I pay for it. And I went back and I fixed it, but I wanna spare anybody from trying to do that. Um, and then staple line reinforcement is the same issue I discussed on the previous slide. Now, these to me are the seven essential steps. Why not 10? Well, because I don't think there are too many. It's really honestly seven. Uh, to me, but you know, you can break them down and you can certainly come up with 10 steps. But number one to me, of course, I'm not discussing port entry, uh, port placement, pneumoperitone, of course, but just the technical portion, you got to be able to expose, right? So liver retraction is number one. Again, you can use a mechanical external one, internal one, or stay sutures like I do. Number two, you have to examine the diaphragmatic crura to rule out a hiatal hernia. Uh, some people say that's not a step, right? That's not intrinsic to the sleep, but I do think it's essential uh, to be able to rule it out at least. And, and of course, 
if you are very persistent and, and passionate about it, you could create one and that's the wrong thing to do. So be careful, just make sure that there's nothing obvious. Otherwise, if you start dissecting, you could end up creating an artificial hiatal hernia and that's not the right thing to do and you can put your patient at risk. Um, the next one is greater curve mobilization to five centimeters, usually anywhere from four to six centimeters proximal to the pylorus and you stop right there. Don't get too close. I'm sure Dr. Eisinger is gonna talk about that issue too. Uh, don't get too close to pylorus, it's not worth it. And the antrum of the stomach is also a natural sleeve anyway. So we don't really need to alter it too much. Um, then creation of a gastric sleeve with a calibrating tool, another controversial topic. We can talk about using bougie sizes. You can talk about using the endoscope as your bougie. Whatever you end up using, the experts have uh, determined that anywhere from a 36 to a 40 French bougie is safe. Anything less or anything more, be very careful. Of course, you could tell me, Dr. Oviedo, you know, you could have a 40 French bougie and hug it so much that you could end up causing a stricture. I get it, and I agree with you. Or you could have a 36 French and stay so much away from it that it ends up leading to weight regain. Of course, I'm just talking about keeping it uniform and trying to stay next to the sleeve. Uh, anywhere from 36 to 40, I use a 40 French. Or, you know, in difficult cases, sometimes when anesthesia cannot pass a bougie, I just leave the endoscope in. I put the endoscope myself or my resident will do it. And then we can, you know, we can, we can, as long as you don't stay too close to the scope, you're gonna, you're gonna be okay. Because if you think about it, the scope is not that, uh, doesn't have a big diameter anyway, it's about one centimeter. So be careful with staying too close to it if you're using it as a bougie. Um, an optional step is staple line imbrication versus over sewing versus an omentopexy. Look, um, for, the, for the fellows, I'm sure you know, Imbrication is not the same as over sewing. So over sewing technically means passing the needle through the staple line and it's almost like a baseball stitch, continuing to run it. Imbrication is more than that. Imbrication is completely hiding the staple line. I'm talking seromuscular lember bites on the stomach. And so uh, to me, that's even more useful for uh, patients who have a lot of bleeding and tendencies to bleed or propensity to bleed because they've been on anticoagulation, et cetera, or, or immunosuppression, transplant patients, you're afraid they're gonna leak. Imbrication is essential. Or otherwise, if it's just to control a little bleeder on the staple line, you can just oversaw it. Totally fine, figure of eight is fine. Finally, I strongly believe in an endoscopic leak test. I, I think it's essential for our fellows and residents of fellows to learn endoscopy. We are the inventors of endoscopy, not gastroenterologists, all due respect for my GI colleagues, we are the ones who invented endoscopy. It's our field. We have to reclaim it. We have to become expert endoscopic, endoscopic surgeons. And so endoscopic leak tests are essential. Not only are they a leak test, they're also a test of patency. So you can determine if you, if you are causing a, if you're predisposing your patient to a, to a stricture or stenosis. And they're also a test for hemostasis. So of course you can see if you have any internal staple line bleeding that you can easily control with a clip endoscopically or, or any type of uh, injection of epinephrine or whatever you wanna use. So I know it's a lot of talking, but seven steps that are essential. I'm gonna show you two videos today. Uh, I wanna keep it very brief and to the point. The first video is already, again, even though the title mentions a couple of products, I'm not endorsing anything, okay? So the first video is edited. I used it for a talk in the past. It's edited, it has the typical four port technique. And back in the day, I was using a metallic liver retractor. You're gonna see the Nathan's on elevating the liver. It's a nice one edited and I'm gonna stop it at a certain point. I'm gonna tell you about technical points. The second video I wanna show you is unedited. It contains mistakes made by my residents and by me and fixed at the same time. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be fast forward, uh, forwarding a little bit and pausing it. And I'll tell you about the same technical aspects. And that one contains the three port technique, and it has the elevation of the liver with the steak suture. So you're gonna to get to see both. So we begin with this one. For robotic sleep gastrectomy, the greater curve is mobilized with the vessel sealer device, starting from the midpoint of the greater curve continuing distally up to five centimeters proximal to the pylorus. In the same fashion, the vessel sealer is used to go proximally by dividing the short gastric vessels, staying very close to the greater curve on the stomach and while avoiding injuring the capsule of the spleen. Complete mobilization is very important to make sure there is no retained fundus. 
up to the left crease of the diaphragm. Then the shoe form stator is used with a black lobe first with seam guard reinforcement followed by application of two green loads with seam guard reinforcement all the way. This continues with blue load cartridges until there is complete separation of the specimen from the gastric sleeve that is created. It is very important not to get too close to the GE junction to prevent a leak. An endoscopic leak test is performed looking for patency as well. Okay, so that was a very easy video, but it's edited. And, and, and of course, you're not seeing what happened in between. So now I'm going to show you a different video and I'm going to pause this one, fast forward, etc., and make some comments. And uh, keep in mind, this one is only for the three port technique and it has a uh, stay suture to elevate the liver. This was a tougher one, believe it or not. It was a patient who was, uh, had a higher BMI, female patient with a lot of visceral fat, but it still worked with three ports. Uh, so he, he, here we go with this one. So we, I, I like to go in with optical entry, just direct optical entry with a laparoscopic trocar. Um, I don't typically use a varish needle. That's my B, plan B maneuver, but it's totally fine to use a varish needle. Absolutely fine. The initial survey, uh, a little bit of gas on the transverse colon. The main, the, the first step is really after placing the port is elevation of the liver. Fatty liver disease noted. Um, we're going to begin by placing my uh, trocars. If you notice, this one is not being used. This arm is just really three instruments, one for the camera and one for the vessel sealer and the bipolar. And um, this is, and I, later on I used four ports because I realized that this patient had a lot of visceral fat. And so here we go. The first, the first one is to place a suture on the diaphragm. Sometimes I begin right here on the abdominal wall, number one, that's it. Then number two is a suture on the diaphragm. And number three is a suture that goes underneath the falciform to the right upper quadrant abdominal wall, and then you place it right here. Sometimes, depending on the anatomy, you can just go one, two, three, and stay right here. But many times, most of the times, I end up crossing over. So one, two, and three. And so when you do those maneuvers, it takes a little bit of time to get used to it at the beginning, but it really, really works. And you can provide yourself with very, that, that's what I'm doing, that's step number three. You can provide yourself with very nice traction on the liver. You can pass it a couple of times. Be careful not to place it close to the rib cage because you could be entrapping intracostal nerves, just so you know. So just, just you know, a couple of passes and lock it, and that's enough. And I'm not a big fan of leaving needles in the abdomen. I always cut the needle, get rid of it. I, I don't want to have any issues with lost needles and, and or, or uh, inappropriate counts, et cetera. So once we finish, as you can see, one, two, three, four, we ended up doing four points for retraction on this big liver, uh, thick liver. It's not really huge, but it's very thick. So now the step I mentioned is opening the pars flaccida and then examining if there is a significant hiatal hernia to repair. Otherwise, you leave it alone. This patient, I don't believe this patient had anything significant to repair, but we explored, we ex exposed the cruise of the diaphragm. Now, in this case, we're going to begin with the, what I was talking about, which is the the exposure of the greater curve of the stomach. Typically, I don't like to start right here uh, past the inside shore angularis. I start proximal to the inside shore. I learned in fellowship that this is the easiest place to get in. It's the, it's the thinnest portion of the greater momentum if you, of the gastrocolic ligament. If you try to get in in this area, you're also very close to the right gastroepiploid. You end up getting with some bleeding, getting into bleeding. So this is the easiest part, of course, since this part of the stomach is coming out anyway, you can get very close to it. Just make sure you don't perforate it, right? So get close to it. And then you would never do that in a fundoplication, right? If you're mobilizing, you would not stay that close. Um, eventually, after three applications of energy, you end up popping in and getting into a lesser sac. It's not that difficult to do. Um, pay attention to the retraction. One hand up, one hand down. Always triangulation. And what works for me is having a grasper on either end, one grasper here, one grasper here. This is typically my bipolar. This is a carrier usually. Then the camera can be in either one. Here is a camera, right? But if you had any difficulty with visualization, you can put it on this one. You can do camera hopping, as we call it, and then interchange with this. So the central trocars usually are for the camera. 
Uh, so this is the camera, this is the one for the stapler later. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch, switch instruments and put the vessel sealer here so I can continue to go all the way up to about five centimeters proximal to pylorus. Here we go. I'm gonna fast forward. I know it can be a little boring, but anyway, I tell my residents, be very careful we get into the prepyloric vein of Mayer region because you can get into bleeding at the same time. If you, if you eliminate the blood supply to this portion, I know that you're still relying on the right uh, gastric artery, sure, but if you eliminate by mistake the gastroepiploic here, then there is a higher chance of ischemia, relative ischemia, and then your patient will have more gastric atomy and dysmotility, and you end up putting them on, on metoclopramide and more medications, and it's just a more difficult uh, recovery rather than a very smooth sailing type of recovery. So uh, we stop at about five centimeters proximal to pylorus, and then that's it. And be careful, of course, with in this area, it's very easy to cause a thermal injury on the posterior aspect of stomach. Now, we're going to march along and, and go, now I'm gonna switch again. I'm gonna switch, put the vessel sealer on this one, switch for the carrier, and now we march. Pay attention to this hand. Look, retraction is essential here. This is the hand that pulls. This hand that will hold the greater momentum, this is the one that I don't use when I use the three-port technique. If it's an easy case, I don't use the this grasper to grab momentum. It's just the camera, plus this one, plus this one. But I rely on gravity, but here is a tougher one. So I'm relying on a grasper. Look, this one pulls more. This one doesn't pull too much. This hand is supposed to go and make it horizontal, just like that. Don't pull too much with this hand towards you. If you do that, you're bringing the spleen with you. So you're causing higher uh, a risk. You're, you're, you're setting yourself up for a higher risk for a splenic bleeding, honestly. So just make it horizontal. That's all you need to do. This is the one that pulls. The stomach one is more forgiving. You can do that. The vessel sealer continues. And, you know, I'm going to fast forward very soon, but this is not even the most difficult part. As you know, the most difficult part is when you're getting really, really close to the spleen. Short gastric vessels sometimes are so short that they're coming directly from the splenic artery. Be very careful with that especially when you're at the uh, upper pole of the spleen. If, for example, I had a complication once when a patient had uh, a very large blood supply from the short gastrics in that area, it wasn't so much, it was more segmental. It wasn't so much from the splenic artery, it was more from these branches, the short gastrics. And when I completed my sleeve in the proper way, nothing wrong was done, my patient developed an abscess of the upper pole. And so that led to multiple uh, attempts at radiology couldn't do anything about it. I ended up doing a laparoscopic drainage procedure myself, getting into the abscess, abscess cavity. So um, try to eliminate that risk by just staying close to the stomach and retracting properly. I'm going to fast forward a little bit just so you see that part that I'm talking about. I think my resident was participating here and there was a little bit of bleeding, but it wasn't that big. It's very important to remain calm. When you encounter bleeding in that area, the, the worst thing you can do is get nervous start yelling, screaming, and, and everybody loses their temper. And then there is a higher likelihood of opening. And you don't want to do that, honestly. You want to try to keep it robotic or lap as much as possible. And remember, in an emergency situation, I read this in a book, the first vital sign to get is your own pulse. So just remain calm, apply suction, apply uh, um, a, you know visualization, number one, suction, and then clamp whatever vessel is bleeding. And then you can ligate it, you can suture it, whatever you need to do. Uh, there was a little bit of oozing in that area, but it wasn't anything major. So we're going to continue. This is the retraction I'm talking about. See, this arm is retracting towards towards the 11 o'clock position. This one is simply holding the momentum, and and you and you bend the vessel sealer all the way up here. Now, what if you're doing laparoscopy? Well, just rely on more retraction on the stomach, and if you don't have an articulating instrument, that's okay. You can still get it done from this angle. And sometimes if it's difficult, then just come from this angle. You can use your energy device from this angle, laparoscopically if necessary. Uh, we're almost done with this part. I exactly what I was telling you about. A lot of times the bleeding comes from right here. At the very end, if you're not careful enough, you're gonna tear that. And those short gastrics have a lot of pressure. Remember, they're coming from the splenic artery. It's a lot of pressure from the aorta, from the celiac trunk. So be very careful with that. It's just, it looks very intimidating and torrential bleeding, but uh, you can, most of the times you can control it with proper MIS techniques. Uh, again, I, of course, there is a risk of causing thermal injury here. That's one more thing, thermal injury to the fundus. But I mean, as long as it's the fundus, it's coming out anyway, right? So, but if you stay too close to GE junction, that's a different story. Now you're setting yourself up for a leak. So careful there. Always try to sneak below 
I try to come below this way sometimes, not only here, but sometimes I come here from the short aspect and then I can come in this direction. So sometimes you, it works this way, sometimes it works this way. It depends on the anatomy. Like here, I'm coming this way from underneath. And so you attack it from this angle or you attack it from this angle, whatever works as long as you're not causing bleeding on the spleen. That's what I'm talking about. A little bit of oozing, but it wasn't anything major. Now, um, the other issue to talk about is, I'm gonna fast forward to complete that, exposure of the left cruise of the diaphragm. is very important to visualize it. If you're not visualizing it, you're just seeing a lot of fat, chances are you're still having some retained fundus. So make sure you don't leave any retained fundus because otherwise your patient will have chances of higher chances of weight regain and also reflux. Uh, now, we've, we finished that um, and the suture is still holding up. And I think I lost the retraction, but that's okay. It's not that essential anymore. Sometimes it happens, it slips when the liver is very thick and bulky. That's okay because you don't need that type of uh, uh, retraction anymore. Now, it's just about creating the sleep. So we're about to do that. We're gonna remove the vessel sealer. We're coming in with the stapler very soon. I'm just making sure I identify inside Shura. Once I know it, I come with the, the first firing. I don't, there you go, this is Shura showing it to my resident. The first one I don't do with the bougie. I just do it like that. I, I have learned through trial and error that when you have a bougie and you try to staple the first time, sometimes the bougie distorts the anatomy and then you don't end up with a very uniform, beautiful sleep. So it's very important to just, the first one just staple on your own but then stay away from Insisura. And what I do is I measure with the tip of the graspers, usually 2.5 centimeters. That's plenty. As long as I have a grasper length right here, then I'm okay. I know that my scope will go without any issues. Don't stay too close because otherwise you cause a stenosis. Um, again, I'm measuring for my residents right here, and then we're gonna staple. I'm using reinforcement as you can see, but you can definitely do it without it if you want, um, or, or if you don't have access to it for that matter. And so now, um, the next one, I'm gonna ask anesthesia to pass the bougie. And there you go, that was easy. Sometimes it's more difficult. It takes a couple of seconds. We leave it right there. And now the rest of it is just continuing. Now keep in mind, the next staple line is also crucial. You don't wanna stay too close to insure. You wanna be very, very careful. So the next one continues this way. Some people uh, uh, do, there you go. So this hand is retracting. So it's horizontal, looking like a pancake, right? Very horizontal and then the staple will come this way. Important not to hug the bougie too much, right? Just come in straight. The, uh, the other thing is some people believe in using one single staple load, thickness, uh, color. I, I don't, I believe in graduating it depending on where you are. So I typically use, use black and then green, green, blue, blue. Some people believe in using all greens, I, I, I don't. Um, anyway, I'm relying on the shoe form smart clamp technology, but if you have a laparoscopic stapler, just pay attention to the noise and how, how slow it goes and that gives you cues as far as what color you, you're gonna use. Um, very rare to use only one color in my practice because uh, the stomach changes thickness, as you know. So here, I'm, I'm making sure that I roll, I call it rolling the sleeve, making sure that the sleeve has certain distance from the stapler, that's, and so that's perfectly fine, you can do that. You may think, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make my patient a little tighter just so that they can lose more weight, careful with that. You get too close and then you're gonna have something to regret. So. Uh, we continue. Now, this is easier. We just stay next to the bougie, vertical. Vertical, sleeve gastrectomy, literally vertical. Keep going up. Yes, I know there's a little bit of a curve, but as long as you retract with your hand, you're still applying the stapler vertically. Finally, almost done. This is me showing my resident. Just keep retracting horizontally. I don't like it when it goes up. When it goes up to me, sometimes it distorts the anatomy. Horizontally, in my practice, is easier. Then I continue, and important to leave the fat pad in that area. The fat pad is your mark, so this is the line. You leave a little bit of a, a almost like a dog ear. I, do, I know it doesn't sound elegant to say that, but it's almost like a little dog ear. You don't want to stay too close to the GE junction because then you could cause ischemia, too much tension. So this is it. So you go and, and then don't leave any fundus, right? The other thing to do is sometimes with this arm, we retract the, the, the fundus posteriorly and we go that way to make sure we're not leaving any saccular uh, stomach, like a fundus, right? So as long as you go all the way, and I'm telling my resin, keep retracting the same way, don't lose that horizontal retraction. Uh, we're almost done. We continue marching along, and this is all done by the resident, by the way, in our residency program. So uh, 
I usually tell them, if you hear me talking a lot, then, you know, I'll give you feedback. It'll be like a documentary uh, narrator. Uh, the moment I don't say anything is because I know you got this. There's not much for me to say. So they keep going. And, and again, we're leaving the, this fat uh, pad uh, intact. Um, some people excise it. And uh, I, I, I think the less you do, the better sometimes. So the less, less is more. We leave it alone. And I know that that's exactly where the fundus will end. And we stable this way. Again, different opinions, uh, and, and we'll see what Dr. Isinger uh, uh, is going to say in this case. Some people go and dissect a little bit of fat, but I tend to leave it alone, unless, of course, I think I'm leaving uh, retained fundus. And then you, you finish it off. Once you finish, again, see, we lost the retraction, but it's not that essential anyway, not at this point. I do the gastropexy or mentopexy. So what I'm doing is simply two ways of doing it. One way is just to get omentum to stomach, right here, omentum to stomach. You run it, you finish right here, that's all. You're avoiding twisting of the sleeve, so it doesn't twist, it doesn't cause a functional obstruction or volvulus in the future. The other thing is just to go from the retroperitoneal fat to the stomach. Now, be careful, you know what lives down there, the duodenum, so if you take your stitch and you suture too deep, you may cause uh, entrapment of duodenum and obstruction, so be very careful with that. So either omentum or some of the fat in the retroperitoneum, but not too much. And so we run it from here to here. I mean, as fast forward, this is just running a suture. And see what I'm using? I'm not spending money on a needle driver. It's just the same uh, vessel sealer. Now, of course, if I'm making an anastomosis, I'm not gonna do it with a vessel sealer, right? So, I mean, there are suture lines and there are suture lines. So this one is not that essential, not that crucial. So we just do it with this vessel sealer. If you're gonna use it, um, grasp it from the middle of the instrument. Don't grasp it from the tip. This is contrary to what we do in real, in open surgery or laparoscopic surgery, but it's just not a very strong device at the tip. So it's stronger in the middle. So you might, you wanna grab the needle in the middle, otherwise it switches and it dances on you. And that's not ideal. Finally, once we finish that, you can also use it to cut, you know, so you don't need any scissors. Once you finish, you do a leak test. Of course, my resident is doing a gastroscopy we're checking for bubbles, et cetera. We're also checking for uh, as hemostasis of staple line, and we're checking for uh, lack of stenosis. Hopefully, you did a good job. And anyway, that's that's the end of it. That's the video. And uh, I'm going to finish with this. Um, anybody who uh, uh, would like to come to Houston and visit us, we're, we're um, very happy to, 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 to see you here and show you our wonderful facility, teaching facility called MITEI. It's the Houston Methodist Institute for Technology. Um, uh, innovation and education. And so my office is right here. I'm giving the talk right here. All of these buildings are Houston Methodist, the complex, uh, the Mothership Hospital in Houston. And this is the Research Institute and MITEI is the fifth floor right here. So we train residents, fellows, medical students, surgeons in practice, national, international, uh, and we put up courses there. We're having a symposium for our residents on Wednesday. Very excited about that. We're going to be teaching rural and wide gastric bypass robotically, along with left uh, nephrectomy, along with uh, ex uh, extended totally extraperitoneal hernia repair, and finally, total uh, mesorectal excision with LAR. So different faculty will be teaching. It's been a pleasure to address you today, and I'll be happy to take any questions uh, whenever the moderators say so. And I'm sure Dr. Isengart, my, my friend and colleague, is going to follow me with a wonderful talk. Thank you. Hi, Rodolfo. Thank you for such a nice talk on the robotic uh, sleeve gastrectomy. I have a couple of questions. A very nice video. Uh, both the videos, uh, you can see the edited video and the actual struggles. So that was very nice. Uh, is the patient position uh, with the robotic? I know that there's a different discussion about uh, not going uh, full uh, tr reverse Trenberg with the robotic. So where are you right now with that? Yes, Pradeep, thank you for that question. I actually didn't include a slide for that because yeah. I don't change from laparoscopic, uh, laparoscopic, uh, um, laparoscopic principles, so to speak. I know there's a lot of controversy. Some people say in robotics, you want to do, you know, a very steep reverse Trendelenburg angle. I don't think so. I disagree. I think it's just enough. As long as it's a gentle reverse Trendelenburg, it's okay. Now, have I had cases when I have asked anesthesia to do more because there's a lot of visceral fat? Yes, of course. But most of the times it's just a gentle angle, like a 45 degree angle. That's usually enough for me. Um, honestly, the angles are more crucial for me when I'm doing a bypass or do a switch compared to just a sleep. But 
it's whatever you're comfortable with. And, and at my hospital, we don't have that special bed that pairs with a robot. I used to have it in San Antonio, not here. We're trying to get it, uh, but it's okay. I mean, you can just undock if you have to switch and dock and dock again. Yeah, I was going to ask the next question. So have you had trouble with un undocking and docking? Because most of them do not have that uh, uh, automated bed with the XI robot. Okay. Um, I saw some of the additions in the in behind the stomach in the near the pancreas. Do you uh, deliberately go look for them, take them down? Uh, what is your idea behind that? Or yes, and so I, I keep saying to my residents, less is more. So if it's something obvious, go for it. If it's something that if you're really, really trying to push and dissect and doing like an oncologic resection, you're doing something wrong. This is not a cancer operation. And so please just do whatever is necessary as long as you expose the posterior aspect of the, of the stomach and that's enough. Uh, sometimes when we try to dissect too much and we go after the pancreas, it, it, we cause more bleeding, denervation, et cetera. So as long as you have enough room and you're within the distance from the pylorus, then I stop right there. Another quick one before I, I give it to the other persons here. Um, you're crossing the staple lines. I mean, some of the you know, old fashioned, with, and I know there are a lot of easy discussion now that you can easily cross staples and without any issues. Have you noticed with the sure form, especially with the sure form, it is going to detect whatever your uh, staple light is, it's going to detect all the stuff. Has it caused any trouble for you while you crossing the staple lines with the sure form staple? Great line? question. Great question. And thank God, no. Uh, I, I used to be so afraid of that. I remember in residency, they used to teach us that, that principle. I still think it's valid. I still think it's a valid principle. But look, I went to, I, I was in practice for years doing bariatrics on my own doing this and respecting that principle. And, and then I went to fellowship and my mentors, they cross them all the time and they cross them for making bypasses. They use the tri triple staple technique. One staple line this went one this way and then you cross this way. And I'm like, this is sacrilege. You can't do that, right? So, but yes. no, no, no problems at all. And I, I now, nowadays I try not to cross, but you're right. Sometimes you're gonna have a little bit of crossing. I haven't, I haven't had any problem with that. And the stapler itself does not say that, okay, you've got some other additional tissue that you should not be in it or anything like that. The robot itself doesn't mention anything like that, right? Okay. Sometimes you are gonna get that message. Yes. Okay. And so what you do is you stop and you switch to a bigger a color, to a, to a larger thickness a stapler. I can tell you though, in two, on two occasions with this stapler, the sure form, I had to abandon it and recruit the help from an endoscopic stapler. And the laparoscopic stapler sta saved the day. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to do that. Yes, I spent more money. I get it. It was a more expensive operation, but I didn't end up with a leak. My patient did well. Um, Dr. Oviedo, hi, this is Dr. Nidhi Khandelwal from Mumbai. It was an excellent Hi. presentation and I must say that the surgery looked really beautiful and um, I have done a few robotics myself and really you can see the definite uh, advantage of a robot over the standard laparoscopy. But do you have any particular selection criteria? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Kandawal. It's, it's a pleasure. I heard a lot about you. And um, I, you know, honestly, I used to select my patients when I was going through my initial learning curve. And I used to do cases with, you know, BMI in the 40s, low 40s, and not a lot of comorbidities, and ideally females, not males. Nowadays, I don't. I just, I, since I already mastered the curve, after thousands of cases, I just do robotics whenever a patient qualifies for MIS. Uh, you know, if I don't have the robot, no problem. I do it laparoscopic. But I, I don't select anymore. But at the beginning, it's smart to do that because you know what happens, they're watching you, the, the credentialing committees are studying your complications. At least in the United States, I'm sure in other parts of the world it's the same. You have one complication in your initial learning curve and you may risk your experience in the future, so. Right, right. So um, any tips for the young surgeons out there because this is a program completely directed to them as to what they need to select when they are starting off with robotics? Yes, excellent question. For the residents or fellows or younger attendings or consulting surgeons, I would tell you, be smart, be very careful. I, my advice, my piece of advice would be to be selective. You're just getting started. Select the, the ones that you think are going to be the simpler ones. Don't go in and do it on a patient with reoperative surgery with, with you know, a history of multiple abdominal operations, 
Try to select the ones that don't have a hiatal hernia at the beginning for the initial ones in your learning curve. Try to select the ones with mid-range BMIs. Now, you be careful with the BMI, though, because sometimes you may do it on people with BMIs between 35 and 40, and those are tough. For some reason, they have a lot of visceral fat, and I can't explain it. It's a really funny type of discovery. I learned that throughout the years. So you may, you may think that 50 BMI or above is the worst. Sometimes the 30 BMI could be a tough one, too. But in general, be, be selective, you know, try to do those. Now, once you do maybe 10 or 20 and you feel ready to take the next challenge, start doing that on, doing it on, the, on males, people with higher BMI. You can add them, the ones who have a, an obvious high hernia. Um, surround yourself with, with senior partners or people who have more experience than you. Uh, remember, asking for help is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of maturity and intelligence. And so... Uh, have mentors. You know, Tux is an incredible um, society. We can mentor anywhere, anyone in the world virtually, right? So we don't even have to visit. Uh, visiting would be more more uh, ideal, but if we can, then we can just do a, a virtual consultation and, and, and walk you through the procedure, et cetera. So there are different ways that we can coordinate uh, uh, helping uh, young surgeons. But that would be my piece of advice. And then honestly, after 50, 100 cases and you feel more intrepid you could still do more difficult cases and go from there i would say start with sleeves one more thing start with sleeves then you go with bypasses and then in my experience i started doing revisions after that i felt very comfortable and then i went on to the odino switch and, and so on and so forth Fair enough. That is usually the ideal learning curve for anybody who's starting off in bariatrics anyways. And uh, one last question. Uh, do you do any preoperative upper GI endoscopy to rule out a hiatus hernia beforehand? Excellent question. Another controversial topic. I do. I firmly, firmly, 100% believe that it's necessary. It has changed my approach. It has changed my recommendation to the patient multiple times. Most of the times it doesn't change, but it's still good to know what you're facing. And um, I, I firmly believe it's very beneficial. I used to do it on my own. It's great practice to do it on your own, but now I'm so busy, honestly, with surgery and teaching, I send them to my GI colleagues and they're very happy to do that for me. And that also increases my referrals anyway. So, but I, but I, I never lose the opportunity to, to do it in the OR. I do the endoscopy in the OR so I don't lose my skills. Right. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Do you have some comments or any questions for the speakers? Dr. Blom? Yes. Do you have any comments or questions for the speaker? Oh, very, very nice uh, presentation. I, I agree with totally with uh, the, the indication of the robotic surgery. And uh, during my presentation, I precise uh, the dissection, etc., etc. Thank you, Dr. Blanc. Welcome. I have a few basic questions from a postgraduate side. Uh, like uh, when you do the bougie, when you put the bougie, uh, is there any method to keep the bougie on the lesser curvature side? Like I did a couple of procedures and the bougie kept coming on the greater curvature and I couldn't uh, fire the staple. Yeah, I know. Patience and, and the method really, you have, you have to grasp first. Rely on your graspers. Just tell anesthesia, go back a little bit, keep going back take it out slightly, and then just redirect with your two graspers, your two hands. You can push one way, you can push the other way. Eventually, it'll go. Just use both hands. Use both. Now, if you're using the three-port technique, good luck, because now you only have one hand. And, and, and you know, don't, do, don't go in and do a three-port uh, sleeve right at the beginning because it's more difficult. But you can figure it out. After hundreds of cases, your brain makes the connection, and you can figure it out. But use both hands. Use them together in synchrony, and you'll be able to pass the bougie. And I get it. Sometimes it's difficult. Look, if you're getting frustrated and you're not making any progress, just put, put an endoscope in. Don't waste time. Just put an endoscope in. It'll be okay. And uh, Bhushan, just as, uh, as a continuation for the discussion there, if in sleeve, it's easy to push the bougie because once you have taken down the greater curvature completely, you'll be able to lift the greater curvature from lateral time to anteriorly. And use the two hands, like Dr. Arav was mentioning, both two hands and lift it out. And then all you have is lesser curvature for the bougie to go straight down. So in a laparoscopy, if you're doing it, able to lift it up. You probably had difficulties in non-sleeve patients or before you did the greater curvature mobilization. But if you once you mobilize, you just have to lift it all up, both hands and push it towards the lesser curvature and it will come out easily. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to introduce the second speaker of today, Dr. Alexander Isengard. He is a gastroesophageal and bariatric surgeon at University of Florida Health, Gainesville, USA. He is the president elect of Florida State Chapter of American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. He has also served as a lieutenant commander in the US, Naval, uh, US Navy Medical Corps and has been a departmental head at the US Naval Hospitals in Yokosuka, Japan. He has multiple peer reviewed papers on bariatric surgery in his name. The screen is yours, Dr. Alexander. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the uh, very kind introduction and very kind um, invitation to present for my colleagues. You know, Dr. Oviedo did an excellent job giving a talk on sleep gastrectomy. So I think my talk will overlap a decent amount. Um, so Rodolfo is an excellent presentation. It makes my life much easier because I don't have to talk as much. But uh, I'll try to point out a few other things, a few other hints and tips um, during my presentation. And then I'll show the video of one of my also robotic sleep gastrectomies. And I'll try to sort of narrate as we go along and describe some of the additional tricks and um, let me see. Let me share my screen with you all and then we'll get going. So please let me know if for some reason you can't see the screen. Hold on a second. For some reason it's starting at the bottom of the screen. All right. So, you can see it. So, yeah, perfect. Thanks, Rodolfo. I appreciate it. All right. So let's get on with the talk. My um, Disclosures, I'm a, I am a consultant and instructor for Intuitive, <clears throat> but I completely agree with Dr. Oviedo that we should not be reliant specifically on the type of technology. The presentation here should be technology um, unbiased or technology blind because all of these concepts apply both to laparoscopic and robotic techniques as well as any of the industry's uh, instruments, any of the company's instruments. And as a matter of fact, if you follow the right principles, you shouldn't be reliant specifically on the one company's technology to be able to get the job done and get it done well. Um, as a quick review for all of our trainees, you know, these are the established operations in the United States and around the world as well. You know, obviously adjustable gastric band has fallen out of favor over the last 15, 20 years, but the other three operations are the most popular operations currently in the US. Um, you know, of course, today we're discussing the vertical sleeve gastrectomy. And, you know, this is the sort of the new operations that are pretty hot currently and are being introduced in the United States. Um, so single anastomosis duodenal ileal bypass with a sleeve has just become approved in the United States about two years ago. The mini gastric bypass or one anastomosis gastric bypass has not yet. Um, but again, today we're only concentrating on a sleeve. So we'll move on onto the, well, this is just a quick slide to show you that the sleeve is currently the most popular operation. So on the left, you see the United States numbers and probably about 60% of the operations in the United States are sleeve gastrectomies. Um, I completely agree, agree with Dr. Rodolfo that this is not an easy operation as some surgeons think, and it should not be done by people who are not trained to do this. And this operation needs to be done by somebody who knows the particular tips and tricks and um, indications and contraindications as well. So just because it's the most popular operation, it's perceived to be the most technically easiest operation to do. It's not, and it can potentially lead to significant complications and a lot of misery for the patient um, long-term if it's not done properly. Uh, in the world, the results are about the same. So sleeve is also the most popular operation. Um, this, this data is about five years or a little more than five years old actually. But again, sleeve has overtaken the bypass and all the other procedures as the most popular procedure now. All right, so onto the sleeve gastrectomy. Again, you've seen an excellent talk by Dr. Oviedo, so I don't have to belabor the points um, as far as the basic conduct of an operation. You know, this is just um, a quick review of what steps you should take. And then I'll go through some of the particular tips and tricks and some of the pitfalls to avoid. So in, obviously in the beginning, you're separating the greater amentum and gastrocolic gastrosplenic ligaments away from the greater curvature of the stomach, as you've seen in the last um, presentation. Of course, once you get up to the proximal stomach, the fundus, proximal fundus, and the angle of his, it's very important to be able to separate all the retrogastric adhesions, all of the short gastric vessels, and expose the left cruise. Um, again, Dr. Oviedo has mentioned that. That's key in order for you to be able to mobilize the fundus completely, because otherwise what will happen is when you staple the stomach in order to create a sleeve gastrectomy, you'll end up having a retained fundus and 
that leads to inadequate weight loss and also increased chance of developing reflux. So once you mobilize your stomach completely um, and it literally is flopping in the wind, of course you advance your bougie at some point before or during that step, you advance your bougie or your endoscope in order to measure the minimal size of the sleeve. And then you proceed with the stapling of the sleeve itself. Now I will mention in my next slide, some of the tricks as far as where to start the stapling, what size bougie, we'll discuss this in a second. And then of course, once the stapling is done, then you know there are some other things you can potentially do such as again, hiatal hernia repair, or you know some of the surgeons, um, and myself included, we do a mentopexy where we suture the amentum to the staple line in a few points in order to try to keep the sleeve from twisting and creating a corkscrew appearance. All right, so as far as the commandments or the important points on doing a proper sleep gastrectomy, and again, Dr. Oviedo has mentioned pretty much all of these, but I just wanna make sure that these are um, highlighted before we go on to discuss uh, or to watch the video that I'll show you in a minute. So first, and again, this has been mentioned over and over again, you have to mobilize the greater curvature completely, right? The sleeve gastrectomy cannot be performed properly if your stomach is attached to the Retrogastric, you know, retrogastric adhesions or it's attached to the short gastric vessels, it is just not going to work. And at the same time, you have to take down all the attachments posterior to the stomach, to the mental bursa, to the pancreas, to um, you know, the colon, anything that's around it have to be taken down completely. Bougie size. So Dr. Oviedo is right. Uh, most people I know use bougie size of 36 to 40 French. Um, the official recommendations are 34 to 40 French, anything below 34 French, and you risk creating a very narrow sleeve, which will give patients a lot of nausea, a lot of intolerance to PO intake, and at the same time, a lot of reflux. Uh, bougie sizes greater than 40 French can lead to inadequate weight loss. So most people do anything from 36 to 40, but again, um, keep in mind that A, you know, one French, and it's basically, if you look at the millimeters, it's one to three. So it's the difference is very minute. And then two, and again, Dr. Oviedo has mentioned that it's all about your technique. So most people will not hug the bougie, meaning they'll not come too close to the bougie. You know, they'll stay just a little bit far away from it to have a little bit of the play between the bougie itself and your stapler. And that pretty much gives you a proper size sleeve. But again, that takes a lot of experience and a lot of sort of art instead of science. Um, the other point that people have asked already in the questions, in a question session, um, you have to start stapling somewhere around five centimeters, so four to six centimeters proximal to the pylorus. And that's the important point. And that has been shown by the Michigan Bariatric Collaborative in, in a lot of their studies that antrum is a mechanical pump for the stomach. Antrum also, um, or having the antrum prevents you from develop dumping and prevents you from having bad reflux. So you do want to preserve the antrum as much as possible and start your staple line proximal or, you know, right where the incisure is, but um, you want to leave as much of the antrum intact as possible. So a lot of us will actually start the staple line about five centimeters away from the pylorus. Again, it's been mentioned that staple height is important. So um, again, technology, unbiased opinion, you have to know the size of the stapler, uh, staple heights for the staplers that you use, and you have to apply it appropriately for the tissue thickness that you're on. So a couple points, <clears throat> distal stomach, especially the antrum is pretty thick. So you have to accommodate for that. And especially if you're using a staple line reinforcement material, um, which I do occasionally as well, you know, you have to accommodate for that and increase the staple height um, that you use for those fires that you have your uh, staple line reinforcement material on. You know, you have to know that the stomach thickness is not uniform throughout. The stomach gets thinner as you go more proximal, as you go towards the fundus. As a matter of fact, fundus is the thinnest part of the stomach and you have to go down on the staple height when you get up towards the proximal fundus. Otherwise you'll have a lot of bleeding. Um, and it's probably most important to make sure that if you're operating on a revisional operation uh, or you're doing a conversion, that you have to accommodate for the thickness of the scar tissue around the, um, the stomach itself. And again, you have to kind of size up on your stapler height. So each company has its own color code for the staple loads that they use. You know, for example, you know, you have black, green, purple, you have blue, um, 
tan white, you know, so they have different color codes, but you just have to learn what the staple height of each color code means, and then obviously use the appropriate stapler load. Um, the other point, again, I completely agree with Dr. Oviedo, you have to look to see if the patient has a hiatal hernia, and you have to repair all hiatal hernias, especially in sleeves. Sleeve as an operation in of itself is already prone to creating reflux in some patients, not in all patients, but in the substantial portion of the patients. On top of it all, if uh, you do notice a substantial hiatal hernia, and then once they sort of lose the weight and a lot of the fat around the esophagus and GE junction melts away, it allows the sleeve to migrate into the mediastine and migrate into the chest much easier. And oftentimes you will notice intrathoracic migration of the sleeve into the chest, which will give them reflux, nausea, vomiting. You know, So if you do see hiatal hernia, you absolutely have to dissect it out and repair it. Now, as far as how to dissect it out, most of us do only posterior dissection, right? So we only mobilize the esophagus posteriorly, open up the diaphragmatic or um, hiatal decussation, so the posterior V, a bottom of the V, and then we'll close that. Now, some people do circumferential esophageal dissection, which I don't necessarily agree with, because I do think that the phrenoesophageal ligament, um, that fat pad, plays a role in maintaining the stomach below the diaphragm. So I don't mobilize the phrenoesophageal ligament, but I do mobilize the esophagus posteriorly, close the diaphragm um, if I see a hiatal hernia. And then probably the most important things, A, you do not want to be close to the incisura when you take your first staple fire. Um, incisura or being close to the incisura and creating a stricture at that area is the number one reason why sleeves will leak and oftentimes they'll leak proximally right next to the GE junction or right next to the angle of his. But that's simply because of the tightness of the incisura creating a very high pressure zone in a proximal stomach. So whatever you do, avoid the incisura, try to stay far away from it on the first fire, because to be honest with you, that's not the area where people will lose the weight. You know, most of your food gets collected in the fundus. So the fundus is the area that you want to keep putting arrow, not the incisura. And then the second point also pretty important is do not violate the angle of his. So the angle of his containing the sling fibers is the number one reason what prevents you from developing reflux. And if you screw up the sling fibers and come too close to the esophagus right at the top, right at the top on your last fire of the stapler, what will happen is A, you have a much higher chance of developing a leak because that area is pretty ischemic. And then B, you will have a much chance, much higher chance of developing reflux because you're eliminating the angle of his, you're limiting the sling fibers, and you're basically creating a common cavity between the esophagus and the stomach, which tends to promote uh, reflux. A couple of the other things that are controversial, you know, in my opinion, they're not controversial, you know, because there is clearly evidence, or at least some evidence, if it's anecdotal or empiric, um, you know, it's still some evidence in my book. But so staple line reinforcement that has been shown to definitely decrease the chance of developing bleeding postoperatively. There is still some debate whether it actually decreases the chance of leaks, but bleeding has been shown to be um, significantly improved. I do use staple line reinforcements on a lot of my patients. Um, the only time I don't use it, to be honest with you, is when my surgical techs don't know how to place the, the seam guard that I use, um, the staple line reinforcement material into the stapler and it becomes a huge flail. So I try to avoid that situation in general. But I do agree with Dr. Vieira. I, I tend to lose, uh, use staple and reinforcements often. And then the second thing, again, and I do that myself, it's the amentopexis, where you suture the amentum that has been separated from the stomach back to the staple line just to keep the sleeve straight and not twisted. Some people believe in this. Some people don't believe in this. I guess there's not a whole lot of evidence here. So that's why I put it in my controversial um, box. But at the same time, you know, it takes literally two minutes to do so. And um, I don't see the reason not to do it. So now, this is what the complications of a sleeve gastrectomy can be. So obviously, complications are divided into the early and late complications. The early complications, the ones that we're all really afraid of, of course, is leak and bleeding. Um, and of course, you can also have poor emptying of the sleeve immediately postoperatively, which will make patients pretty miserable and give them significant PO intolerance. Usually poor emptying is caused by swelling, but you can also have early onset of a stricture because you, again, this first staple fire was too close to the incisura and you know you made the whole situation um, worse by literally narrowing the exit from the proximal stomach into the distal stomach. 
Um, now, of course, you can have other non-technical issues. You can have DVT, PE, you can have, you know, patients have um, surgical wound infections, but the most important complications that all bariatric surgeons who do sleeves are concerned about uh, leak, bleeding, and of course, poor emptying or poor shape of the sleeve. Now, speaking of that, some of the later complications, you can have a stricture, you can have corkscrewing or twisting of the sleeve, and sometimes you can have a fistula if you've had a leak in the past that will develop into a chronic fistula. Some of the um, more common complications and a lot more annoying to deal with, but not life-threatening, are, of course, reflux, so GERD and the hiatal hernia after a sleeve. And in GERD, I include formation of the de novo Barrett's esophagus, which, as a matter of fact, is slightly higher than in normal patients normal morbidly obese patient. I published a uh, meta-review analysis a few years ago showing that the de novo barriers is slightly higher in patients who've had sleeves, <clears throat> which as a matter of fact is the reason why we recommend endoscopic surveillance one to two years after an operation and then every three years or so afterwards. Um, and of course, esophageal adenocarcinoma, carcinoma, which is so far has not been shown to be the case, only the Barrett's. And then probably the most common complication, so to speak, or um, poor long-term outcome is the weight regain or recurrence of metabolic disease or both. And by metabolic disease, I mean diabetes primarily. So these are the complications of the sleeve. Um, the biggest one, like I said, is reflux. And this is how you avoid it. And then this is how you deal with it. Um, this is showing you a picture of a very well-performed sleeve gastrectomy. As a matter of fact, if you kind of zoom in at the top right here, you can see the sling fibers that are draping over the angle of his right at the G junction. Um, <clears throat> and again, like I've mentioned that this is one of the mechanisms uh, that will increase the chance of developing reflux after a sleeve is if you eliminate or destroy these sling, sling fibers at the top. So the reasons why people develop reflux after a sleeve gastrectomy include a development of the hiatal hernia, a development of the stricture, at, primarily at the incisura, which is gonna be right in here in this area, a retained fundus, meaning like Dr. Oviedo has mentioned, you haven't dissected the fundus enough proximally, and you haven't visualized the top of the stomach, the left cruise, the G junction, the angle of his, all of that, and you end up leaving too much of the fundus behind. And then of course, the narrow sleeve that's just overall too narrow, again, going along with the bougie size that's too small. Um, the way to sort of repair this or deal with these problems, you know, there are a lot of them and some of them are easier than others. So for example, with a hiatal hernia, you can do the hiatal hernia repair. Now, in some patients that works, in some patients that only leads to either mild improvement or very transient improvement. So a lot of us will do a hiatal hernia plus something else. Now that something else, most of the time is conversion to a gastric bypass. But you can also do other things as well, such as place a Lynx device, which is somewhat controversial, but I do believe into that if the sleeve anatomy is perfect. Um, you can also do a Hill gastroplasty, and you can also use a ligamentum teres wrap, which is basically a poor man's version of a Lynx. If you have a stricture at the incisura, there are a couple of ways of dealing with it. Uh, first, of course, and the easiest one is the endoscopic dilation with a large achalasia balloon, a 30 millimeter balloon or stenting. Stenting works reasonably well, but stents do tend to migrate a bit. Um, you can also try to stricture a plasty, which I've tried, and it doesn't usually lead to a whole lot of positive outcomes. Um, or of course, you can convert these patients to a bypass. If you have a retained fundus, you can re-resect or re-sleeve. And of course, if you have a very narrow sleeve or a poorly, poorly constructed sleeve, the best option of the situation is to go ahead and convert the patients to a bypass with a pretty short pouch because you're eliminating most of the poor anatomy um, by leaving a very short pouch and then doing the anastomosis right there. So I just wanna thank you for my quick presentation. I'm gonna uh, switch now to a video of my robotic sleeve. It's very similar to what Dr. Vieira does. You know, as a matter of fact, him and I are almost like twins as far as our technique is concerned. I don't do the three port. I would like to do four port because I don't like to struggle, um, but everything else looks about the same. So let me share my video. Quickly, hold on a second. It's about five plus minutes and I'll narrate as I go along. So, all right, so this is sped up and this is edited. So, you know, my sleeves don't usually take five minutes, take about 30, 40 minutes, you know. So first thing again, <clears throat> I'm gonna stop as I go along. This is a teaching, 
case because I work with residents like um, Dr. Vieira does, and I was showing them in the beginning how you measure out, how you see what the pylorus is, you measure out five centimeters so you know what sort of the, the ideal beginning for the staple line is. And again, just like Dr. Oviedo does, I don't start dissecting immediately where, you know, basically the antrum is. I go a little more proximal on the stomach just so you don't get into the blood supply or you don't damage the stomach that's not coming out. You can see the bougie is already placed into the stomach. I usually do it myself or sometimes anesthesiologist places them. I use a 36 French bougie and it's going to be advanced a little later um, into the stomach once I actually start doing the stapling. So we start the dissection. Another important point, I just pointed out to the resident where the gastropeploic vessel is. I do not touch the gastropeploic vessel with my assistant hand because I do believe that if you mess with the gastropeploic and you crush it, you will create a clot, which will propagate into the splenic, which will propagate into the liver. And that's how these patients occasionally get the significant clot burden in the liver, which is one of the feared complications of a sleep gastrectomy, but it's very rare. So obviously you mobilize the gastrosplenic or I'm sorry, gastrocolic, gastrosplenic ligaments. Um, again, you stay right in the stomach because this is all going to be coming out. So there is no fear of burning the stomach. And again, the blood supply is, tends to be a little more um, smaller when you are dealing right next to the stomach with a short gastric versus closer to the spleen. So you want to expose the greater curvature to the best of your ability. You can see the splenic vessels below us. We go along trying to mobilize everything. And again, this is what um, Dr. Oviedo is pointing out. You have to make sure you mobilize the entire fundus. There are a couple of tricks to doing that. And the most important thing to remember is the stomach, once mobilized, is a very floppy mobile organ. So you can rotate it any way you want to. I was pointing out to the residents where the, where the splenic vessels are. Now I'm mobilizing around the spleen itself. <clears throat> again, I completely agree. If you do get into some bleeding here, don't freak out. Don't do anything. The more you try to do, the worse it's gonna get. So your best bet is to just tampon out and wait for a few minutes. I was pointing out to the resident where the left crew is, or left cruise is. I'm mobilizing the left cruise nicely. Now this patient did have a small hiatal hernia, noted an endoscopy, and then as well as in my sort of initial diagnostic laparoscopy. So I will show you how to do a quick hiatal hernia repair on this lady as well. Now we're dissecting distally, we're going again, towards the antrum. My goal is usually to dissect all the way to the point where you have a lot of adhesions to the pancreas and that's where you stop, right? Because there's no reason to continue going distally anymore. You know, so like once you start seeing a lot of these adhesions, that's where I pretty much stop because this is where my staple line will begin. Now I'm gonna do the hiatal hernia repair. Again, it's a very small one, but it was noticeable in endoscopy and she did have some reflux pre-op. So we decided to go ahead and explore this area and I will place a single stitch in there eventually. Opening the pars flaccida, pars condensa, that's her right cruise right there that you can see. Um, hold on a second, somebody's in the video has froze. Let me try to restart this again. I apologize for that, we're giving some temporary technical difficulties, but at this point you've gotten the idea. Um, huh. Well, my video is frozen, so I don't think I can show you the rest of it, but you um, saw this stapling uh, that was performed by Dr. Vieira. I do exactly the same thing. So I use, uh, you know, depending if I use staple line reinforcement or not, I do um, either green or blue loads on my stapler. And then of course I use um, a thinner stapler height. So I use either blue or white loads actually now these days and robotically um, when I staple approximately <clears throat> right at the fundus. And then of course, you know, if the patient does have a hiatal hernia, I place a stitch at least once or twice. I'm trying to figure out if my video is ever going to come back and work. Um, and then if let's say the patient doesn't have a hiatal hernia, you know, that, that pretty much completes my stapling job. You know, I do the air leak test the same way as Dr. Vieto does. I either use the endoscope or a Visigy device, which is a bougie slash an OG tube. And then the last thing I do is I do a mentopexy and then the operation is pretty much complete. Um, yeah, for some reason, my video player just ceased to work. So I apologize for that. I won't be able to show you the remainder of my video, but it's pretty close to what Dr. Vieto does. 
um, and it should have, you guys should have a pretty good idea of what we do when we perform sleeves. So at this point, um, not to belabor the same points over and over again, I'm going to open up the floor to discussion and I'm happy to take any questions um, right now if you have any, or you can type them in on the chat box and I can answer questions this way. All right, again, I apologize for technical difficulties, but that's pretty much all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Alexander. That was a nice uh, discussion of the uh, indications, how to manage, uh, uh, what complications to avoid and all the stuff. So it was pretty, very, very good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I have a small video of laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, the uh, moderator did ask me to give, see if I have any snippets. So I, I felt since both of you have done a good robotic uh, technique, I would uh, show a small uh, four or five minute video of a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. The same technique, uh, but uh, for people who do not have the access to the robot, uh, uh, this is a, I would think this is a good way to learn. Um, let me see if I can uh, share the screen. All right, everybody can, everybody can see there? Yes, sir, we can see there. Okay. So, performed. so this, uh, well, I'm sorry, the, here, the, I wanted to point out the couple of things that I want, I thought of interesting is that both of you mentioned five centimeters, six centimeters, four to six centimeters, but no standardization. So here I use a stitch that is uh, cut by the nurse on, on a surgical tech on a table itself for six centimeters. I mark the pylorus up here with a, a pre vein and then mark it so I know exactly where to uh, stop my, my dissection, where to start my stapling. This is the one way I've, I've done it. I've, in the other way, technique is to use a marking, uh, marker to mark it area itself. That's what I learned from my senior partner before. So I, I do that. The thread that I measure where I want to divide the greater curvature, greater mental. Okay. Have my assistant this, uh, on that side here. This year old female with a Dissected. BMI of 42, uh, presently for sleeve gastrectomy. I start taking the uh, greater curvature vessel. I usually go uh, one centimeter away from where I eventually want to divide the stomach. Some people go even higher. But yeah, this is where I could go higher, like both of you, both Alexander and Rolf mentioned. But in this case, I just go very close to where I would eventually divide. I know this is a reasonable location to get into the lesser sac. Having the assistant to retract the stomach in this early phase will help you with identification of the greater curvature vessels. And you can see clearly with the ligature, especially this curved tip, I really like it. It gives you a good uh, curve along the greater curvature of the stomach to stay close to the stomach itself. And now after that, I usually use my left hand uh, to retract the stomach. My left uh, hand is in the right upper quadrant uh, along the anterior line and the uh, uh, right hand is in the mid-clavicular mid line um, it's a mid trocar. you can see my left hand is uh, pushing the stomach pulling down and the assistant is uh, this is what the Adolfo was mentioning that we need to use the stomach to be pulled down and out to be able to do that not the momentum but the left hand should be pulling it out and this one more technique that I noticed is that I lift the left hand up the momentum out and you can see Always, before you go for the splenic region, take the posterior short uh, attachments to completely turn the stomach over. And now you can see that once it is done, you have very good visualization of the uh, stomach and the spleen. This is where I, I think the key for early surgeons of uh, gas juniors is that take the posterior adhesion down. Don't try to go for this right away, right on. Then you can uh, close the spleen, I have close the stomach and you can make the bleeding. I usually go behind this and you can see clearly. Here you can see the stomach is almost attached to the spleen, but with good visualization, you can easily dissect this area. And try to go posteriorly first before you tackle the short gastric that is close to the spleen. And once you have this, you have a nice window and you can see that the window helps you with the nice dissection. Even here, you can see that there's a short posterior gastric with the left assistant hand pulling the stomach medially towards me, it helps to dissect very well. After this, you can see that there's a short posterior gastric that is coming directly into the posterior stomach. This is where I, I have my assistant, uh, instead of holding the momentum now, push the posterior stomach wall such a way that you this have a nice dissection. Push the and you can see 
just push the stomach no need to hold it and you can see how we can clearly dissect this area very beautifully and get a very good uh, view very good dissection safe no bleeding at all i usually double uh, uh cauterize with the ligature uh in the sense i i cauterize once and before i cut it i try to cauterize again and you can see very nice view and nice dissection once you can confirm that the posterior all the dissection is complete make sure you're left this is where i, I we were talking about the posterior fundus don't leave any posterior fundus here so this is the part that would have been left along if you not take this uh, uh vessels behind and you can see the le left cruise showing up nicely in this case eventually here this is clearly visible as in this case you can see up to the posteriorly yeah I'm sure left cruise. i check it again and i know i can i need to take the issue is my preferred uh so once you do that it's a 16 purple again i go here adolfo was mentioning that it's a straight vertical sleeve most people go with the incision right here and just start the stapling right here but my marking showed that six centimeters was somewhere here so I did go close to six centimeters rather than going here and then go across. Don't go vertically in this one. The first stapler should go across away from the incisura. Talking about two and a half centimeters, I, I slightly go more on the, up to three centimeters or so, so that I don't want this area to be angulated because the next stapler will come this way. And by mistake, you go two and a half here, but go next one close here, you end up making a tight strict near the incisura. The first one I go uh, almost horizontal. I usually take the bougie out because if you put a bougie to try to stay in the stomach and it will give a false sense of security. I have to go as far away from the angle of incision as possible. Yeah. Again, again the, I, I don't have the bougie in for the first one. I, I don't like the stomach to be distorted. Uh, I use a tri stapler technology, uh, laparoscopic. After the first stapler, stapler, I put the bougie and now you can see that it's come quite far away from the angle. I leave that posterior uh, pancreatic addition down still. In this one also, I stay slightly far away from the bougie itself, along the blood vessels itself. I use another 60 purple uh, stapler. These two staplers, I would like prefer the purple load because of the tri staple technology. I did not use the stapler and reinforcement due to the cost concerns in India. And you'll notice that I'm, I've changed the camera to another one and going to a uh, another 12 mm trocar near the umbilicus because this case I wanted to do be cost effective. So a linear stapler in India is cheaper than a tri stapler. So here I'm using a blue After load. that we can go to the blue loads. In this case, for cost efficiency, I went to the uh, blue loads, uh, straight non-articulating ones. So I had to change the trocar camera. I put a five millimeter camera on the assistant side and uh, through the previous camera side, I put the 60 blue loads. This is another technique I want, want to emphasize is that please turn the stomach posteriorly and anteriorly. Flip it over and see behind. Make sure you're not leaving too much stomach posteriorly. Some people say, I might, I might some of our panelists might disagree with me. That way you may have to twist the sleeve itself. But I find that if you don't, you end up leaving posterior stomach sometimes. Take as much posterior stomach as possible. Always flip the stomach anteriorly and posteriorly. Make sure you have enough posterior stomach and not leaving too much posterior stomach here, especially near the fundus region. In this case, I was able to do it with the four staplers itself. Uh, pretty straightforward. Some people go very close to the antrum, around three centimeters, three to four centimeters from the antrum, but there is not a, a significant evidence to show uh, that there is a excess weight loss with the closing going. The, the rest is all pretty much the, um, the bag placement. The retrieval of the specimen. Again, okay, this is a homemade bag that we use in India. We just make a large bag based on a regular uh, suction irrigator bag and use a nylon stitch, not a designated one. Um, the specimen with the fundus inside. The the one thing I will say is that helping with the bag. Just for fundus retrieval of the specimen for the junior the faculty. Hold the tip of the uh, staple line so you can pull it out easily. So have them hold the staple line right there and bring it out up close to the trocar before pulling the bag out. That way it stays close to the mouth of the bag and when you are uh, pulling it out, you're grabbing it itself. Uh, drain, a customary drain for peace of my mind. 
and uh, so yeah that's it uh, the technique for my, uh, for my my technique of laparoscopic uh, sleeve gastrectomy there um, again the drain obviously i i back in us when i was performing a few years ago i stopped using the drain there again when once i came back to india new technique new uh, uh, resources new places i would rather put a drain uh, i do not have access to a staple and reinforcement i would love to have that so that way i have a good uh, control of bleeding fortunately in this case there was not much bleeding from the staple line but usually you see some bleeding uh, if you don't use a staple and reinforcement make sure your stapler hold it for at least 10 to 30 seconds before you uh, staple it and uh, if you're using the covidian uh, tri staple technology it automatically cuts and backs again but sometimes after you staple after you staple but not cut wait for at least 30 seconds is what we usually recommend for our surgeons here in india um that's about it um any comments Dr. Balati, that was a really great presentation and uh, the sleeve was once again very beautifully done. Uh, I believe my technique is also more or less similar to yours. I also tend to flip the stomach posteriorly and check it out because I don't want to leave a lot of posterior stomach behind. Um, I just wanted to ask you a couple of things. Um, do you do any post-operative CT gastrograph and swallow or anything of that sort? Uh, back in years, after getting enough 100 cases or so, I stopped doing the gastrograph and swallows. Again, coming back to India, I've started doing them just for peace of my mind and for peace of the patient's mind. Uh, the other thing that I do mention is to get a gastrograph swallow early on. In, in that case, you'll see how much fundus you left out. The gastrograph swallow will show how much fundus you left out. And that, that really helped me in the first few cases by, uh, in my starting career to see that, okay, I, I didn't take enough posterior stomach. And after taking the posterior stomach, almost like the one I did, I showed you, I didn't have to do, I mean, the swallow looks like a straight swallow. I mean, this straight sleeve, you can see that. That is just to get an idea. I do not personally think that a sleeve uh, swallow study will show a leak because leaks do not happen in a sleeve gastrectomy on post of day one. They usually happen in three to five days or so later. So this, if you are comfortable, if you've done enough of them, I don't think you need a swallow study. But as a starting learning technique, it's good to have a swallow study to compare your, your technique with. Right, exactly. And what about any intraoperative leak test? I'm sorry, I missed that part of the video. I, I, do, I, did, I did do an endoscopy to make sure there's no leak test, no leak in this one. Right, okay. Some, some difficulty with uh, having access to endoscopy in the operating room in uh, India, especially. Uh, I did notice that, but I had to make some calls, make some arrangements. Uh, most uh, surgeons are not adept with uh, endoscopy here, but, but I am, and I'm able to do the endoscopy, so that was convenient for me. But some of the other surgeons have to coordinate with the gastroenterologist and do an endoscopy. So you might, instead of doing endoscopy, do a methylene blue test, which is another technique. But I don't think if your step line looks like that, you are, there are some people who stop doing endoscopy and or any kind of a leak test itself. I do not blame them. I don't think there's need to do that uh, going forward. But early on, I think that just gives you peace of mind. Again, I also have a similar experience uh, considering cost and coordinating with the gastroenterologist. So that's why even we use a methylene blue leak test on table. It just made yes. life really convenient. And uh, we've just made it a habit to do it in every case, no matter how the case is gone, uh, just for, you know, to sleep better at night. That's it. That's about it. I think uh, this is very much the difference. I, you know, what I feel is that... Uh... I've seen uh, in, in between US and India, and, and I think Dr. Uh, Oviedo and Dr. Uh, Eisengard both will agree with that, that in, in, the, in, in the US, uh, most of the surgeons do their endoscopy by, by themselves. In India, mostly that we have to call the gastroenterologist, you know, they come and they do the intraoperative endoscopy and coordinating with them is definitely a very difficult task. So mostly we end up not using endoscopy in many of the cases. Uh I would like to ask my, my, uh, my presenters, uh, do you use a Vizio? The Covidian was coming up with a new bougie slash uh, lighted bougie slash uh, with the uh, ability to do a leak test. Uh, have you guys used that? Is that any advantage? 
Um, good question. So I do use the VCG device. It's essentially yeah. bougie slash an OG tube and allows you to do an air leak test. That way I don't have to do endoscopy in all the patients postoperatively. I do agree with Dr. Oviedo and the previous um, panelists that endoscopy is important. And if there's anything abnormal at all, I do it immediately, either pre-op or post-op um, or intra-op usually. Um, but uh, I do tend to use the VCG now because it allows me to minimize changes. I just place the device in the beginning. I do my stapling, I do the air leak test, I take the device out and the case is done. Um, you know, you can use a regular, you can use an endoscope for that. Just be cautious, most standard endoscopes are about a centimeter in diameter, which gives you a range. I agree with Dr. Weisengard. I, I used it back when I was in Florida, and it's a really nice device, at, very convenient. I, it's not essential by any means, but it's it makes the surgery go uh, you know, smoother and it's very convenient. So if you have the opportunity to use it, absolutely. Uh, not only that, it, it looks like a, it makes the stomach looks like a, like a, like an expanded stomach. It dilates, it, it, it expands it horizontally. It looks like the sail of a boat. It's, it has lights. I mean, it's, it's a really fancy device that allows you to see the anatomy very well. Um, Dr. Blanc, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, please, 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 sir, Dr. Palatin. The Omentopex C. I, I'm not sure about that. Uh, okay, my senior partner used to do it. I did. I do not see the stomach rotating or having a valvulus with a, a lesser. Uh, I, because I don't take any uh, lesser uh, lesser curvature itself. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I did have. A, I did want to warn because I did have an incident where I thought it was. It looked very floppy. I ended up putting a stitch on the. Uh, instead of the momentum, I used a little bit of pancreas, the anti-surface of the pancreas along with it. And lo and behold, it, when I did the endoscopy, fortunately, intraoperative endoscopy itself, I could still see a significant kink in the sleeve that I end up having to, fortunately, I was still there, so I was able to take it down. So since then, I haven't done the omentopexy. And I, I, I don't know, it doesn't give me any uh, sense of... Uh, Holding that, that because the momentum itself is so floppy, I do not expect that that will hold the stomach in place. What are your thoughts, Rodolfo and Alexander? Yeah, good question. Actually, to correct myself, I did use the BZG in Florida, but I also used a different one called Gastroseo, and that's the one that has lights. Really interesting device. Uh, I use both, but anyway, uh, similar concept. It's just that this one has lights and makes the stomach look very horizontal. Um, in terms of the omentopexy, I tell you, I used, I used to not believe that it was useful until I had a problem with one, one of my patients. And then I went back and I saw that it was actually true. Multiple endoscopies never showed a, an obstruction, a mechanical obstruction. And then lo and behold, I go in laparoscopically and I see it is twisted. And so um, ever since I started doing it, I agree the omentum is very floppy, but even fixation to the omentum, uh, to the gastropolic ligament, offers some stability. Or if you're intrepid, you can actually fixate it to the, to the retroperitoneal fat covering the duodenum, and that's actually more stable. You just have to be very careful not to place big, big bites, not to, not to place uh, big stitches with your needle. But it can be done, and it offers some stability. And ever since I started doing that years ago, I never had any problem like that. I also do it because we get referrals for uh, patients who have done poorly and we're a referral center and we fix them that way. We, we, we tend to see that issue a lot. And that has to do with my experience more often when surgeons actually get too close to pylorus and they, they truly make the sleep look like a banana. You know how we say to patients, it looks like a banana. Not really, but if you actually stay close to pylorus, it really truly looks like a tube. It looks like the sleeve of your shirt. And then that's a problem. It tends to twist more. Uh, but I'd be curious to see what Alex has to say. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. I, uh, I do think that mentopexia does play, you know, at least a small role in trying to prevent the twist. Because, you know, if you have a lot of the corkscrew and a twisting of the stomach, usually it's because the stapling wasn't done properly and the surgeon didn't follow the anterior posterior walls of the stomach and kind of twisted the staple as it went along. But sometimes it's simply because in the process of healing, the sleeve just kind of moves away from the retroperitoneal tissues and doesn't get adherent. So it does help to amentopex, in my opinion, you know, it takes five minutes and it doesn't really cost much of anything because it's just one suture. You do a couple of bites in different spots. Um, so I do think it's helpful and, you know, 
same time, I sure a lot of people don't. And again, there, there's a lot of, it's not currently standard of care, to be honest with you. There is a question on the chat box uh, regarding somebody explain more about staple line reinforcement. I'll talk about it. Uh, you can please add up. Uh, staple line reinforcement is basically uh, uh, either a seam guard, uh, uh, which is Ethicon sponsored. Covidian also has its own uh, um, non biological uh, seam uh, reinforcement. It basically uh, adds another half a millimeter or so to the staple line, uh, reinforces the bleeding at the staple points. So if you have seen my presentation, there was nothing between the staplers. Mine was without a reinforcement. And if you have seen Dr. Rodolfo's staple lines, you can see the plastic thing that was hanging out. That is the reinforcement. And it helps uh, generally agreed between most surgeons that it will definitely decrease the amount of bleeding. I totally agree that the bleeding from the staple line itself is much less if you have the reinforcement. Not sure about the uh, leaks, not sure about the staple line leak or an astomatic leak, whether any technique. I think it just decreases the amount of bleeding. Does it make significant? Probably not. Not that uh, you may not need blood transfusion, but you will see less RBC in the field than without a staple line reinforcement. That's my take on it. And I can tell you, it's it's really very, very useful, especially in patients who have uh, reoperative surgery, revisional patients. As I mentioned, patients on chronic anticoagulation, cardiac patients, immunosuppressed, very, very important to use. Um, you know, if, if I don't have it available or if my tech is not comfortable with placing it, et cetera, then at least I imbricate. But I, 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 tend do, I tend to do something because of the acuity of the types of patients that we take care of here. Uh, they're usually very sick. And so I tend to do something, either imbricate or, or, or over sew or use it. And the other thing is the concept is that it, it is a polymer material that uh, makes the tension, makes the staple line formation more even. And so the staples, when they form, they form a perfect B with that type of material because the tension is equally distributed horizontally. It's a really interesting concept that the bioengineers have been working for for almost 10 years already. And and um, I tend to use the, the Singard one, but you know other companies make, like you mentioned, uh, J and J Ethicon makes them. Uh, Covidian Medtronics has their own version of it, and, and so certainly Singard is not the only one. Another question on the chat box is: What is the current recommendation about a drain routine use of the drain? I mentioned my take on it. Uh, what is your uh, take on it, uh, Rodolfo? and uh, my, my take on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for, for sleeves, I usually don't do it. For bypasses, only when it's really a tough one. For revisions, I used to drain everybody. Uh, and nowadays, when it's an easier revision, I don't. Uh, there's a lot of controversy, and people will say, no, drains are, are uh, detrimental, and they increase leaks. And that's based on papers that don't have a lot of, to me, there were, there were biases to those papers. And at the same time, my dad always tells me, son, how difficult is it to place a drain in the OR? And I say, it's very easy. How hard is it to remove it? It takes a second. So just place a drain. If you're thinking about it, just drain. And uh, ever since then, I've been applying that concept. And so if I'm worried about something, then I leave it. There's nothing wrong with that. And patients, thank you for it. Yeah, absolutely. I don't use it routinely as well. Um, and I used to use it a lot more in revisional cases and only in the last five years, I'd say I've only been using it very occasionally for revisional cases, but not in routine cases, unless I suspect something off. But at the same time, if I do think that something doesn't look right, the drain is not the way to deal with it, but just to go ahead and take care of the problem immediately. Right, I have a similar experience. Um, initially, when I started off my career at that time, I used to put a drain in practically every case, but as time has progressed in sleeve and even in routine bypasses, I don't leave a drain anymore. I usually just put in a drain uh, only for revision cases now. But again, when you are starting off, when you're young, it's just safer. Yeah, I agree. It just gives you peace of mind as an early starter that you're not taking a big risk. And that should be the way to start, I would say. Don't be cocky and try to start a case and say, I won't put a drain early on and have a difficulty with it. Especially, I think the first one or two cases that I had some bleeding that there was nothing I needed to do, but having the drain, just a little bit of bleeding that I could just the drain will take care of it. I didn't have to worry about it. Another question in the chat box is um, any difference in timing between robotic and laparoscopic? Uh, I, I will talk about laparoscopy part. 
takes around 45 minutes to one and a half hour, depending on the difficulty of the case. I do think the robotic takes it slightly longer initially, especially if your operating room setup is uh, not ready for robotic. And if the team is not quick enough to, for exchange of instruments, exchange of staplers, you need to have a very good bedside a technician to take care of the robot. Uh, if you have good, if you have a good turnover, I know I've been to the Methodist Hospital, Rodolfo, I've been to the, uh, uh, Florida also, where they do the robotic, a lot of robotic cases, and they were quick, and they were able to do under 45 minutes of sleep, is there. So I think there's no difference in timing if once you have an experience, but definitely the robotic does take slightly more longer time. What is the weight loss percentage? I don't think that should make any difference. The laparoscopy or robotic, if you do the technique the way it is, you do a nice sleeve gastrectomy, there should not be any difference. Any, dif any change in the discussion from the panelists, please? Uh, do we I have any comments from Dr. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. Um, I, I would say at the beginning, absolutely right. It takes longer. But later, once you master your curve, and not only you, but your team, it takes actually less in my experience because it's much more smoother. You know, I, I can do it. I, I, we can definitely do it in a matter of 45 minutes, 40 minutes of consult time, sometimes even 30 consult time. Um, but at the beginning, yes, it takes longer. And many of the papers that came out years ago, comparing and talking about the, how much longer it takes to do robotics, how much costly, keep in mind they were written based on experiences by people who were still in their learning curve. They were using a lot of instruments. It was a lot more money spent and uh, their teams were not properly trained yet. So it, of course it took longer. So if, if you took a paper from now uh, and, and you compared it to a surgeon who has already mastered their learning curve with their team, I, 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 I agree with you. It would be the same amount of time. It wouldn't even uh, make a difference or it could be even shorter to do it robotically. I, I do like the way you were able to use a vessel steel as a uh, needle holder. I mean, I think more and more people are more conscious now not to use a unnecessary new uh, instrument for every f need. So that way the cost cutting has definitely helped. Um, how to tack, tackle inadvertently stapling the bougie? I do not recommend ever stapling the bougie. So I, uh, one technique I do, uh, for prevention, I do mention is that whenever I first I put the stapler in place, whenever I know that the bougie in place, once I lock it in, before I staple it, I have my anesthetist pull the bougie out half a centimeter or so back, back and forth. Just gently pulling out. That gives you a sense that, okay, you're not holding the bougie. That has been one of my senior partner's uh, technique that I learned and I use it every time. Sometimes when, you're, when you know you're far enough, you don't have to worry about it. I hope not that the bougie has to stay close to the lesser curvature of the stomach. It should not be coming closer, uh, but hopefully that shouldn't happen. If that happens, stop there, unstable, take the stapler out, go technique. If you do end up having to, the bougie is inadvertently taken out, you have to open the stomach, pull the bougie out, cut the bougie in the stomach restable the stomach, most likely are not you end up having to do a gastric bypass. If you're very close to the lesser curvature there, you probably don't have enough space to do restapling in that case. Uh, hopefully not. I mean, I, just, I would just say that. I had a uh, inadvertent stapling of a rice tube uh, uh, when I was uh, doing a gastric bypass, but that was a bypass and we were able to go back and do a little bit higher up. Again, uh, I saw another question coming up with the rice tube in every case. I routinely put a rice tube Early on, decompress stomach. I think there is some amount of fluid, some amount of air that makes the stomach as a balloon that will com not completely flat for the, uh, for the surgery. But the first thing I ask my surgeon anesthetist is to take the rice tube out. That is a very, very important thing to check with the anesthetist. There's nothing in the mouth before they put the uh, bougie. So that is very key. Uh, if you do put a rice tube, please, please, please remember to take it out before you start stapling. That's what I would say. Any other the thought? Rice here? tube, is that an OG tube? Yes, yes, uh, Rodolfo. This is an OG tube here. It's a rice oh. tube is the OG tube, yes. Interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. I learned something new. It's called a Ryle, the originally designed by Ryle, who the Professor Ryle or whatever it was, but many, many years ago. So in the US, we don't use the word rice tube, it's an OG tube. Yeah, it's a rice tube. Yeah, so there's a nasogastric tube or the rice tube in India and the OG tube in the US, yes. Got it. 
so i guess uh, we can you know so i think we uh, dr blank uh, dr blank wanted to uh, to give a small presentation on his experience of more than 1000 bariatric cases uh, sleeve gastrectomies uh, dr blank uh, yes are you, i am here are you yes can you please share your screen and and yes, we'll 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 proceed with our, our our you know we'll continue with our discussion following uh, okay. Dr. Long's presentation. Thank you. Can you see the slide? Yeah. Yes, Dr. Long. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to participate on this uh, great meeting. My name is Pierre Blanc. I have no disclosure. I am working in Saint-Étienne. Saint-Étienne is near Lyon in center of France. The main activities are uh, soccer, agriculture, tourism, and surgery. Uh, in our digestive team, uh, we are seven digestive surgeons. We were two bioelectric surgeons. And we are a three bioelectric surgeon for one year. We use robotic platform and we use laparoscopic three dimension vision for two years. And we participate to the formation, uh, to the future surgeon formation. It is our activities. You can see we operate uh, through 2,500 patients, more sleep gastrectomy in blue. It was very difficult to operate uh, during the COVID crisis. And uh, we start the robotic uh, surgery for four years and we use this uh, platform uh, for gastric bypass. I operate in a clinic uh, mutualist. Our bioelectric center uh, opening last week with specific colors, a kitchen, a physical activity room for the patient and specific consultation office to avoid any barrier by, between patient and surgeons. You can see some pictures about our uh, operating room, laparoscopic, robotic, robotic view. Sleeve gastrectomy. Sleeve gastrectomy, we have a problem with sleeve gastrectomy because it remains today a lot of question about calibration the resection of the antrum, the problem of the hiatus and the GERD, uh, the interest or not with the reinforcement, the tip of the stapler, the robotic, laparoscopic, etc., etc. Uh, in how team the patient participate to the choice of the surgery, the patient accept a sleeve if we can we cannot do perform a gastric bypass in super obese patient. And we have some contraindication for sleeve gastrectomy, GERD, esophagitis, and large lateral hernia. The first message is sleeve is only a technique, and the preparation and the flop is very important. And if the patient has not a stool stable, we observe a weight regain it's uh, very easy to, for the patient to understand this uh, concept. Sleeve gastrectomy is a reproductive, reproductible technique. The learning curve is perhaps 75. The most difficult is uh, the retroperitoneal fundus removal. It's not an easy procedure. Uh, in France, we don't remove totally the antrum. The technique in laparoscopic and robotic are the same. There is few complication, but the complication is always possible. Like this, a stenosis in the middle of the gastric tube. We are three bioelectric surgeons with the same technique, the same installation, and the same post-operative course. We use a French technique with two screens, one screen for the surgeon, one screen for the anesthesiologics to manipulate, to mobilize, to mobilize the gastric tube. Uh, we use a three-dimension vision in laparoscopic surgery. And the, I recommend three-dimension vision. This vision increase performance, uh, decrease uh, the post-operative complication. Uh, you are less tired. You can work in small space, etc., etc., like in robotic surgery. Robotic platform, we use a few 
uh, we perform few sleep gastrectomy using robot platform because in France the difficulties the reimbursement. Uh, we use robotic in super obese patient and in uh, revisional surgery. The advantage is, of course, the comfort for the surgeon and his assistant. And uh, there is no fulcrum effect. We can operate in small space and we use a fully articulating instrument. You saw the same video. In French, we, we are, have a small group to evaluate robotic surgery in uh, bariatric surgery. The installation. We participate to, to the installation. We use a, a lot of attachment to avoid any slide. During the surgery, any compression, we test the anti train labor position, 80 degrees before the steroid wraps. Uh, the anesthesiologist place the gastric tube in the esophagus. If and the inspection, you see a depression on, in the epigastrium, you know that you have a place in the abdominal cavity and you know that the surgery will be perhaps easy. Of course, in super obese patient, we use not the same installation because it's very difficult to manipulate this patient. We use an American position and uh, we recommend to avoid this patient during the learning curve, of course. We place the first rocker uh, in patient in supine position. The first rocker is placed under direct vision without previous insufflation. It's a bloodless rocker. We place the trocar on the left midline, not on the midline, on the left hippocondria. And our placement of the trocar is always the same. The, on the midline, the trocar is placed 18 centimeters below the six foot process before insufflation. If you measure after insufflation, it's 20 uh, centimeters. And we use two uh, 12 millimeter trocar and five millimeter, uh, three five millimeter trocar. We don't use single port. We don't use only three trocar. Sometimes we operate with two assistants on the left side and on the right side. Uh, there is one end between each trocar, like in robotic surgery. Sometimes we operate with only uh, one assistant on the uh, right side. And in super obese patients, the, patient, the surgeon is on the left side and the assistant on the right side, and the placement of the trocar are the same. In robotic platform, we, has, we have the old system, SI system. We use a three arm configuration and uh, our uh, assistant is very active because uh, she manipulates stapler and she uses two uh, trocar. The instrument, we, we use long instrument, uh, specifically uh, for the coagulation. We use a 30 degree uh, laparoscope, 3D high ten vision for, for, from Brayburn. For the liver retractor, sometimes we use a simple grasper, sometimes not handsome. We use two automatic grasper and one needle order. The camera is placed on the midline and for the stapling, the camera is placed uh, uh, on the left midline. It's very important to have a good exposition of the cardia to, to be sure to have a good dissection of, of, the, of the left cross, of course. And we use a mid tube, 38 French. In super obese patients, we, we use 48 French. And uh, during the stapling, stapling, we are not to close the tube to, to avoid, of course, to, to cut the, the tube. And uh, we stop the mid sleeve tube because uh, we, we have had one stapling and uh, we have had some difficult to remove uh, the, this uh, specific tube on the cardiac. We use an 18 uh, anti thread lemon position in laparoscopic and robotic surgery. You, 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 view, you saw on the first uh, precedent video the, the different uh, uh, tape. 
greater curvature liberation, the dissection of the left cross and the gastric division. We start the greater uh, curvature division on the midline. It's easy to open the omenta bursa. And uh, the anatomical landmark to, to start uh, the stapling is the cross foot of the, of the vagus nervous approximately six centimeters to the pyrrhus. The dangerous zone are the antrum. The antrum is thick and we use green staper. Of course, the angle of is, that is why we, we use systematically the gastric tube and the angle of is uh, the aim is to dissect the left cruise. We use gold stapler because uh, the gastric wall is thin. And if you have a stenosis, the risk is to have a leak. The anatomy is not very complicated, but you know that the fundus is retroperitoneal and the, the difficulty of the dissection is here. And of course, it's very important to remove the pancreatico gastric adhesion to be sure to have the same traction between the anterior and the posterior wall of the stomach. I don't know if uh, it's necessary to, to, to dissect the hiatus. Uh, in case of hiatalania, uh, of course, if uh, we, we found a hiatal hernia, we dissect the hiatus. Uh, we have a lot of post-operative hiatal hernia and GERD. And uh, we don't know uh, if uh, Nissen, not NOCA procedure, but Nissen, uh, Nissen sleeve will be a good option. In previous Nissen fund applicature, sometimes we perform uh, the Nissen sleeve to avoid uh, as a fagus dissection, because the dissection perhaps sometimes is very difficult. We, we test and we use a lot of device to do coagulation, to do, uh, to do the gastric division. And since there is, there is no difference between the different uh, device in the market, the efficiency is the same. Uh, we recommend that just, just to use a long device. Uh, if you use um, fusion, we recommend to be perpendicular to the vessels. It's easier in robotic surgery. Sometimes it's difficult in laparoscopic surgery. And sometimes we place the camera in the number one and we place the ligature or caiman in the double two trochia to be sure to be perpendicular to the vessels and to dissect the chrome, we place the device in the number two to be perpendicular uh, to the uh, vessels. I don't hesitate to place one, two, or three fusions, a virtual clip. I don't hesitate to place any clip, especially in super obese patient on the short vessels. And uh, how to choose uh, the color, we, we use green cartridge on the ant room and gold cartridge on the rest uh, of the stomach. Uh, 10 years ago, we used blue. Now we use specific uh, cartridge gold. We avoid, of course, uh, white cartridge on the stomach. We test a lot of uh, uh, stapler. There is no difference between the different uh, stapler. We use always four to six railroad to perform a sleeve gastrectomy. And uh, we have the same complication with eticon, metronic, et cetera, et cetera. The risk is uh, a stenosis on the angulus. And to avoid, the, uh, to, avoid it, to avoid it, sorry, we place the stapler on the midline and we use the left hand technique. The aim is to have the stapler parallel to the stomach. Uh, that is why the, this trocar is placed 18 centimeters below the xifred process. 
uh, we use the the device to 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 do a left rotation uh, of the stomach to have a good traction of the posterior wall of the stomach and uh, the aim is to have the step uh, a step line in a, an horizontal plane and you know that you are you are not gastric twist it's very important to check uh, any staple between each stapling and remove it to avoid any stapler dysfunction. Power or not power, uh, you know the future of the surgery is femoral. Uh, the advantage of power stapler is the comfort. And uh, if you do a lot of sleeve gastrectomy, the risk is to have a laparoscopic elbow. That is why we, 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 we like to, to, to use power stapler during sleeve gastrectomy. In France, the anatomic, anatomical landmark is the cross foot, and we start the gastric division here, approximately six centimeters to the pyrus. The risk of hemorrhage is one to five percent. The risk is uh, increased in super obese patient with hypertension with sleep apnea. That is why we we oversaw systematically uh, the the stepper line to fix the stomach and to decrease the risk of hemorrhage from the stepper line and to decrease the risk for hemorrhage from the fusion for the gastrocolic ligament. We use barb suture. We avoid any clip because in case of revisionist surgery to gastric bypass, sometimes it's difficult uh, to, to, to cut because of the uh, clip. And you can see we, we fix the step align to the gastrocolic ligament to have a good, good orientation of the stomach and to decrease the risk of hemorrhage from step align and from uh, the gastrocolic ligament. The leak is less 1%. To decrease this risk, we recommend to, to not remove the fat pad and to finish the gastric division on the left side on this fat pad. Of course, it's very important to avoid gastric twist because if you have a gastric twist or a gastric stenosis, the risk of leak is increased. And uh, we perform uh, endoscopy and uh, in case to place a pigtail, uh, the surgeon do this uh, procedure. In our team, the blue methylene test is systematic under real pressure to check any leak, but, but to check any stenosis or to check any uh, torsion. And you can see if you have not, not stenosis, no torsion during the blue methylene test, you have a good, uh, good night. The mean operative time is uh, one hour, no systematic drainage, with skin sealant. Uh, it's a fast track. The patient is discharged on the second postoperative day. We don't uh, do this surgery in day case surgery to be sure to have an house nurse in a surgical unit. Of course, uh, the follow up is uh, with a multidisciplinary team, bioetic nurse with a stool concept. We have uh, an SOS obesity in case of problem. And the message for the team and for the patient, if you have pain, if you have fever, you come to the emergency and we perform a CT with injection and ingestion to check any fistula, any portal thrombosis, etc. We visit the patient twice per year and uh, we have difficulties uh, because we have some lot of you, White Reagan, of course, and GERD. Every day we visit patient with GERD after sleep gastrectomy with, uh, with uh, yatal hernia is a real problem. We, we uh, check the reflux with endoscopy and sometimes we perform robotic roux on the gastric bypass. We have had two chronic lake, one patient uh, 
is spread by uh, laparotomy and who uh, on a Greek gastric bypass on the leak. And uh, unfortunately, we have had one day during the COVID crisis, the patient has a pneumonia. Uh, she doesn't, she, did, she didn't visit our team. She visit all the surgeon and nobody thinks about uh, the leak and the patient is death because of cerebral abscess. Of course, team is very important. Without this team, we can do anything. And I finish with a, a short video. You can see the French position, the installation, the anti labor position. We use two screens in super obese patient. Uh, it's American position. We use a three dimension vision from Beber and Esculap. The vision is the same uh, compared to uh, intuitive. The first OCAR is placed under direct vision on the left hypochondria without previous insufflation. And we place the other trocar under direct vision. We start the gastric division on the middle line on the greater curvature. In this video, we use the sandwich, China's product. The, uh, the same than uh, Eticon. We use the 15 pressure. I tried with my left hand, the assistant tracked with his right hand. The liver retractor, uh, in this case, is a simple grasper. The dissection is very close to the stomach to be sure to have thin tissue to have a good coagulation. You can see there are some uh, adhesion on the posterior wall. Uh, I don't finish totally the uh, gastric dissection. I prefer to, uh, to do the uh, antrum dissection before to cut the uh, short vessels. And we stop the dissection on the cross foot. Of course, it's very important to cut the pancreaticogastric uh, adhesion, and we cut it before uh, the short uh, vessels coagulation, before the left cross dissection. Sometimes I use only scissors without any coagulation. It's the just adhesion. And we finish the dissection. It is the most difficult dissection here. To see the left cross, we don't know if you sometimes, if we, 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 we have to cut the vessels we expose the left cruise to be sure to remove totally the retroperitoneal fundus like this. You can see the active blade is not close to the stomach. We don't remove the fat pad, but we dissect the left cruise. In this case, we, we use a power stapler. Uh, it's uh, the Irish uh, Magnum power stapler, green cartridge. You can see we place and the, we move, of course, the gastric tube before each stapling. The landmark is the end of uh, vessels of the lesser curvature. With this uh, left hand technique, we don't use any uh, angulation with uh, the stapler. We 
we check the stapling, we check if there is any stapler be between the two stapling. The assistant changed the cartridge and we use gold cartridge and the movement is the left rotation with my left hand. And I track the posterior wall with, a, with my right hand to be sure to have a good traction, the same traction between the anterior and posterior wall. Be, of course, we mobilize the gastric tube before stapling. You can see the stapling is an horizontal plan. We check any stapler. No, it's not a stapler. And we use four to six reload. I close, no totally, left rotation with my left hand. I cracked with my right hand the posterior wall of the stomach to be sure to remove the fundus. I close, we mobilize the gastric tube, and I activate the power. And you can see I am on the left side on the fat pad. Here, there is a stapler. It's very important to remove it to avoid any dysfunction. And the last cartridge, we place the specimen in a bag. We place a suture on the thinner extremity of the specimen to facilitate the extraction. There is a stitch on the thinner extremity. We place the bag on the right hypochondria. The anesthesiologist place the tube on the cardia and we perform a blue methylene test under pressure. And we check any gastric stenosis or any gastric twist. Sometimes uh, we, we, we saw uh, um, leak a few. The oversone is uh, systematic with barb suture. The aim is to decrease the post-operative hemorrhage. It's very easy uh, with the three-dimensional vision. It's a good step for the follow. And we fix the tube to the gastrocolic ligament like this with a second barb suture is a 15 barb suture uh, and 26 needle. And you can see I, I don't hesitate because I am in three dimension vision like in robotic surgery. You can find the, this video on my uh, YouTube channel, Laparoscopic Consultant, if you want to see more. And to finish, we can say that gastrectomy is a standardized technique, of course, easier to perform compared to gastric bypass. It remains a lot of questions today, and GERD is a real problem after sleep gastrectomy. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Blong. Uh, it was really, it was a very, really good presentation. Uh, Dr. Nidhi uh, actually wanted to share uh, uh, in a small video of her surgical technique. Uh, okay.
yeah so this is going to be really short and very rapid fire because i think we've covered almost everything that there is to discuss about the sleeve gastrectomy especially in the last talk where even the whole pre and post operative course was completely covered uh, so this is basically my small technique of how i do a sleeve uh, with a sils technique we do get a certain subset of patients who are now you know not just concerned about their metabolic results but also about the cosmetic result of a bariatric surgery so uh, what we use is this four port uh, lagis port and uh, it has two 12 mm holes and uh, two 5 mm holes uh, there are multiple others which are available in the market but uh, from whatever i have used so far this is what i find the most comfortable uh, you just need to take a good 2 to 2 and 1/2 cm incision on the anterior rectus sheet usually just go below the umbilicus and make sure that you take stay sutures beforehand before you put the stroker inside just so that you don't lose the sheath and so that you can also close the sheath correctly later so that you don't have a port site hernia uh just to show you the whole uh, video it's it's a very short clip uh, this is what it looks like from the inside uh, you put in the camera uh here we can see that the liver is not very huge that is something which i normally land up checking on a pre operative ultrasound uh, we ask the sonologist to just measure the liver size especially the left lobe size because it helps us select the patient a little better of course we land up sticking to bmis which are less than 40 to 45 we don't really offer this to super obese and uh, we are not uh, using a sils technique for any of our bypasses either uh one thing which i mentioned earlier we always do a pre op a pre op a pre op uh, endoscopy in all our cases to make sure there is no hiatus hernia because if that's the case again i would not offer a sils to the patient lastly what i always do is make sure that i take a consent because patient safety is most important that we may have to convert it to a multi port technique as well that it may be converted to a standard laparoscopy and that is extremely important and most patients usually do understand that their safety is way more important now one thing which i find here is that uh, with the single incision technique what i have to do is i have to take my ligature in my left hand rather than in my right hand which is standard practice and because of the whole crossing over if the ligature is in my left hand i can do this particular dissection especially around the fundus very easily the other thing is my right hand is completely lifting up the stomach and the left lobe of the liver at the same time so this helps me reduce maybe that one port and sometimes i have had to use a small 3 mm liver retractor or even a suture the way dr oviedo showed before uh if the conditions are conducive enough of course you can completely dissect through and see the left cross ideally again if for any reason i am not able to see it then we'll end up converting uh again uh, stapling is pretty standard pretty much what is being shown again the stapler is in my left hand it's not in my right hand uh which is again what dr blanco was saying in his last video and uh just this whole uh, last bit you know where you can see that uh, my hand is uh, retracting the liver up and with one hand i'm firing the stapler i'm making sure i don't take the pad of fat i'm making sure that there is a small sliver of the fundus which has been left behind just so that i'm not too close to the ge junction so basically even uh, with a single incision technique if uh, you know you choose your patients correctly you can happily uh, make sure that you know the sleeve is still pretty ideally performed uh, again i do an intraoperative methylene leak uh, methylene blue leak test and here you can see we've added pressure at the lower edge and uh, the uh, sleeve is inflating very well and you examine the entire staple line uh probably my most favorite part of uh, doing a single incision sleeve is removal of the specimen because you know it just comes out so easily through a really wide opening and the wound is very very well protected so just wanted to add a little bit more uh, to the entire discussion on sleeve gastrectomy out here thank you so much thank you dr riya i think that that was a very good addition to our uh, whole presentation today the single core technique i think that was not discussed by any other speaker uh, and as well as the panelist uh, so does uh, do, do any of the chairpersons or the speakers have any comments or have something to add or any questions that they would like to ask my only concern with the single incision port is the 2 and 1/2 cm fascial incision that you are going to make um if it is anything less than 1 cm or 12 mm trocar the risk of hernia is much less in these morbid obese patients i mean I, i know you do choose the patient with a bmi 40 or even less than 40 for this single incision once but i just i'm just concerned that the long term wise uh the hernia might be higher what is your uh, experience with the pain uh i did notice that when i did a single a single port they had more pain compared to multi port Do you notice any difference in that, Dr. Nidhi? Uh, 
yeah so i'll tell you what i have uh, first things first uh, as far as the hernia part is concerned uh, like i said i do take two stay sutures right at the end of the entire facial incision at both the ends just so that when i'm eventually closing it i make sure that i completely close it under vision whenever it's been needed which has happened in a couple of cases if i feel that i have not closed the sheath properly i have also extended my incision of course at the end of the day if you take a good subcortical incision it uh, you know i mean uh, the patient should be okay with another 5 mm extension it shouldn't be an issue uh, secondly as far as pain is concerned um i have not really seen a higher incidence of pain with single incisions most of my single incisions i land up discharging on the very next day like just after 24 hours of the surgery so as far as pain is concerned i don't really notice that I want to say um, I really enjoy the presentations from everybody, and, and really, this is a beautiful technique. I'm glad you showed it because uh, you know nobody else had mentioned it, and I think it's important for our fellows and, and junior surgeons to learn that SILS is another option uh, in other parts of the world. It's not really widely uh, done in the United States, but in other parts of the world, it's really something commonly used, and I think it's a great technique, and it trains you to think differently because, as you say your hands are working opposite what your eyes are seeing. And so uh, it, it's a really interesting way in, of operating. And at the same time, it increases your dexterity and your ability to become uh, ambidextrous. And then as far as uh, Pierre, uh, video, Pierre's video, I, I really enjoyed learning about new technologies that I wasn't even aware of, like the Cayman and the Panther and the uh, other stapling devices and, and, uh, and the recommendations that are followed in France. So. Thank you for those presentations. Uh, thank you, uh, all the speakers, uh, all the chairpersons, and our host for tonight, uh, Dr. Bhushan Bhargat. Uh, all of you know all the five, all the five uh, great you know, surgeons that participated today and they taught uh, all of us uh, almost everything possible about sleeve gastrectomy. And uh, I, I, for one, definitely learned a lot from today's session. And uh, thank you, everyone, uh, all the audience, all the audience members who, who came today and, uh, you know, participated with, uh, with, you know, with their active participation, asking questions and everything. And this, uh, so, so uh, for, you know, for information, this video will be uploaded on the Tugs official channel. We have a sub channel uh, for Tugs Fellowship Match. Uh, program academics and uh, the video should be uploaded there in the next three, four, three to four days and I'll be sending out the link to the uh, to the Tux Google uh, Google group as well as uh, uh, we'll also be sharing the the video of today's presentation through through the Google Drive to our uh, WhatsApp group of Tux academics as well as to all the speakers and uh, uh, and uh, the chairpersons. Uh, the certificate will be provided to all the all the people who, who participated in the, in the in the session today uh, for their participation and uh, uh, I, you know all those who are not the member of Tugs, the Tugs is the the fastest growing truly global uh, organization of the GI surgeons and it has I think you know the all the all the sessions that uh, the Tugs conducts uh, all those sessions are wonderful. So I think all those who have not joined it should join it. Should join the join Tugs uh, uh, soon. Uh, they can go to www.tugsglobal.com and uh, go and sign sign in and uh, become a member of it. The membership is free as of now, and probably by next year I, I I don't think it will be free anymore. So I guess this is the year to join Tugs. So thank you again, everyone, and. Uh, uh, Really, thank uh, really big thanks to all the speakers and chairpersons for uh, making our session so successful today. Thank you so much, Bhushan. Thank you, Saurabh, and thank you, Tugs, for this entire platform and for making sure that everybody learns the right technique. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.